Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Shannon Rutherford, the town planner for Farmington. I'll take roll call of the commission members. I'll turn it over to the chair to open our meeting. Um, and as noted, we are starting with an informal presentation uh, this evening. So for roll call, I have Patrick Carrier. Here. Mike Grabulas. Here. Scott Halstead. Here. Matt Hutt-Wagner. Here. Liz Sanford. Here. <laughs> Ina St. James. Here. And I will note for the record that all of our alternates are absent this evening. All three will not be in attendance. Okay, Ines, it's all yours. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ines St. James. I'm the current chair of Town Plan and Zoning Commission. Uh, welcome to our meeting this evening. It's February 9th, and it's 6.32, and it's... Um, well, actually, we should probably do the, um... yeah, all right, couple of things. If, uh, uh, for folks that are not presenting, if you can mute yourself, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And um, let's kick it off with Scott uh, reading the notice, please. Notice is hereby given that the Town Plan and Zoning Commission will hold an online public hearing Monday, February 13th, 2023 at seven o'clock PM on the following applications. Michael Reiner, application for special permit for food court use at 17 Talcott Notch Road, BR zone. Harold M. Wilson, application for special permit for clear cutting and restoration in Ridgeline protection area for property located at 61 Eli Road, R80 zone. Interested parties are encouraged to participate in this online public hearing. The link to this meeting can be found on the Town of Farmington's website on the address on your screen. A copy of the proposal is online as well at the address on your screen or by calling the planning department at Farmington Town Hall at 860-675-2325. Dated at Farmington, Connecticut, this 26th day of January, 2023, Town Plan and Zoning Commission, I know St. James Chair. Thank you, Scott. Well done. Um, Liz, before we start, I know you have an issue with uh, your voice. You have uh, laryngitis. For questions, uh, please use chat. And uh, Shannon, you're monitoring the chat function? Correct. So, yes, we will for uh, for Liz's benefit this evening. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So, uh, this evening, we start with uh, a discussion regarding the 1928 building. And uh, who's going to present that? I believe we have Russ Arnold on to discuss this with the, the uh, commission this evening. Yes, I am here, Shannon. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Russ Arnold. I am the Director of Public Works and Town Engineer for the Town of Farmington. And I want to thank you all for allowing me to come before you for the, this informal discussion about the uh, 1928 high school building and what the proposed uh, updates are going to be for it. A um, couple things. One thing that has come across, people have brought up with the a uh, couple of years ago, there was a vote. There, like 78% of the town's people who voted said that they wanted to keep the 28 building for its uh, historic value to the town and where it sits and how it looks up on the hill. So that's what this project will do. Um, no work will take place on this until after the high school itself, the new high school is completed and the demolition has taken everything else down except for this portion that you see in front of you uh, tonight. Uh, we will be back for an 8-24 uh, for a, a formal approval at, in the future before the referendum vote. Um, so with that, What's gonna basically happen is the building itself will remain as you see. Um, the only additional space is in, I would say, I call it pink, maybe magenta. Shannon, can you go to that? Right there, thank you. That would become the new plaza entrance into the, um, what would become the new town hall. And the first floor is gonna basically be, you'll see the gym, there's a, gym space there with a recreational space. That is the current band room at the high school today when you come in across from the old gymnasium. <clears throat> the 
all the classrooms will be converted into offices. Um, the first floor will be a reception area, recreation, tax, uh, town clerk, assessor, uh, tax collector, and so on, as you can see. Um, the bathrooms will be redone. There'll be another learning space up in the right hand corner, which is currently uh, the principal's office. As when you come in from the circle on your left, uh, the next, second floor, if you could slide, Shannon. The second floor will be the development wing. Basically, it'd be all the offices that are here with planning and zoning, engineering, fire marshal, building, <clears throat> and uh, so on. It'll be open. As you can see, the second floor will be open. You can look down below into the uh, gymnasium area. The third floor will become the town manager's area. Not the, the, where her wing is, it has finance. Uh, the IT department will be in there. Um, town manager and there will be one economic development will be in there as well. There will be a training room. Um, finance will be there. I think I've mentioned that. And more storage. One thing that uh, I think people don't realize that we have to, um, as a town, you have to keep and maintain your file uh, department for any project that comes before us and that gets built, we have to maintain those records for as long as the building is there. So with a town as old as ours, that's a lot of files. And we are really busting out at the seams. If you've been into our office, you can see all the flat files and storage. And there we have a storage space down at the treatment plant that houses a lot of documents for the whole town, as well as the clerk's office and the secondary vault and the clerk's on down on the first floor. And to go forward, uh, we definitely will need more space. Um, one thing that should be noted, there'll be uh, an elevator that's oh, right there. Thank you, Shannon. That elevator will be installed in that from that plaza area in the first floor all the way up to the third floor. Uh, there's a, about 37,000 square feet in this building itself, including the gym and the additional space. Compared to the 31,000 square feet of space that we have here at the town hall. And one thing that we should note, uh, the town hall chambers, the council chambers will remain. The new meeting, outdoor meeting space will remain. Nothing will change there. The meetings will still get held in their same uh, respective places. Um, and I just think it would, this overall will be, you know, not only do we restore the 1928 building, but it, it will remain, a, you know, part of the town's history going forward. Um, and we'll be going to a referendum. Uh, we'll be using, uh, the council decided to use $7 million of ARPA funding that we received. Uh, earlier last year or about a year ago and be going out to referendum right now for uh, $9 million in addition to that for a total of $16 million to do the renovation. Um, and I think with that, Shannon, do we open it up to questions? Uh, sure. Do you want to share the renderings real quick? Oh, yeah. Go right through. Yep. I'm sorry. I see him. I've seen him enough. I just forget who I'm Right. Talking. I know. So, uh, so this is existing what the existing building it would look like at the end with the brick. You know, everything will get redone, repointed. There won't be any replacements. It'll just be updated, and any cracks and things like that will be sealed and repointed. The cupola will get redone. Uh, can you go to the uh, other? There's, there you go. There's a new plaza entrance that would for the town hall. That would be on the back side. That is about where, um, oh, in between the current auditorium and the band room is. Mm -hmm. If you go to the next area, but there's our site plan, and there's the relocated tennis courts, and they're somewhat near final configuration. The parking lot will be separated there. That's specifically for the town hall. Um, See what else we have. Additional parking. Oh, there's a that's the a, like a 1930 poster po uh, postcard that we found, and that's what it looked like back in the day. 
So thank you. Thank, yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, all right, commissioners. Um, again, this is an informal, like uh, Ross stated, and so did Shannon. But um, if you have any burning questions, it's a good time. Uh, Patrick, let's start with you. Do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions. More a comment. I think it looks great. I mean, it's. I'm happy that we chose to keep it. Um, I think it's one of the most beautiful buildings in Farmington, so especially the way it's set up on the hill. Um, but yeah, no, um, no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. No real questions. Thank you, Russ. Um, the only thing I know you've mentioned keeping like the council chambers and the uh, the shed in back. What would the rest of the current town hall be used for? Oh, good question. Like I should have said that, stated that in my discussion. So what will happen is uh, the current town hall that we're in, um, the majority of the furniture is going to get relocated up to the top to the new town hall. Uh, social services will move over here uh, as they are now in the, in the stables house. So that'll give them more room that they desperately need. Um, the food bank, the Farmington Food Bank will move into here. Hmm. Uh, the um, uh, probate court will expand. They need additional space as well. And it will also open up areas uh, for additional space for you know, afternoon classes and continuing ed classes type of thing. That's what people have talked about opening. So it'll just be have that much more space. And we'll also use some of the space here for storage as well. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Russ. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Scott? Scott? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Buzz. All right. Sorry, I got muted oh. now. Sorry about that. Um, to thanks for the presentation, Russ. Appreciate it. And just, um, I guess, a follow up to Mike's question: Are there renovations that are going to be required in the current town hall to accommodate those services you're talking about? Or no, we don't expect any. It'll basically okay. with, with our office. It'll be a blank slate. It'll provide the office space that's needed for the social services if they were to move in here. It opens up a lot of opportunity to figure out what would really be best suited for the town's needs. Okay. And the, the parking that you mentioned there to the right in the picture, is that yes. is that part of the project or is yes. that part of the, okay. Part, so what we're trying, we're ironing out now, we have a, a meeting scheduled for next week with the high school design team to come up with who's got to do what as far mm -hmm. as what costs are associated with the high school project and separated those out from the 1928 building project. So okay. a portion of that parking lot is funded through the high school project itself. Okay. Thanks very much. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Scott. Matt? Hey, Russ. Thanks, thanks for this. Is this the same sort of pr presentation and sch schematics that was presented at the town council meeting back in January 24th? I ask because I know the sort of budget of the project got tweaked a little bit at the end of that meeting. Yes, it is. There's the same uh, rent, same schematics. Um, the council, the original estimate that we have was 16.5, so 16.6 .6 million, and the council reduced that by the 600,000, assuming the savings with the site work that I just mentioned with the parking lot and around the tennis courts and things like that. Okay, great. All right, thank you. No additional questions. Thank you, Matt. And Liz, it's up to you to do the chat or whatever. Um, oh, looks, looks good. good. She said, thanks, looks good. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm, uh, thank you, Russ, again. Uh, glad we're getting a new elevator. Um, I remember being in the existing building thinking I got stuck. So it's the slowest elevator I've been in. Um, the It makes sense what you explained about the current town hall building and the uses. I think it's great. Um, will this 1928 building be used for any of their like uh, emergency emergency shelter or not at all? No. So the emergency shelter will remain with the high school. Okay. So when as the high school gets the new high school gets completed, that will become the new emergency shelter. Got it. And then not really related, but um, you think the tennis courts will be where we're looking at? They just seem so far away from the high school, but. Yeah, unfortunately, um, that's the only space that's left. 
based upon where the high school is being constructed. And with the high school being constructed in the baseball field, the practice field and the baseball field and part of the parking lot, the real the only other green space that's left is up on top, or and that's all the that remaining green space that we have. Okay. All right, makes sense, but um it just seems like they're separate from everything else. Uh, uh, it's it's really not too much different than how it currently was with the tennis courts at the back of the parking lot. So yeah, it's across. very similar, but I, I understand what you're saying. It does appear to be far away, but it's really similar to what we current what we had prior to the tennis courts going away. So okay, all right. Well, thank you for uh, keeping us uh, up to date, and then uh, you'll be back before April, like you said. Yeah, sometime I whatever we got to figure out what meeting it will be at, and we'll be okay. back for the formal eight dash twenty four referral. And I want to thank everybody for taking the time and allowing us to come in and do the presentation and thank you for everyone who volunteers. Thank you for your time. We appreciate thank it. You. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Russ. All right. So uh, we have several new business items. Uh, Shannon, uh, just want to make sure everything that we're looking at is in good order. Uh, yep. We should be all set to go. And I believe at least our first set of applicants, first few applicants are all uh, online, ready to roll. So we should be able to proceed ahead. Wonderful. Okay, good to hear. All right, the first item is an application. It's a sign application um, for property located at 1449-1495 Farmington Avenue. And uh, the com it's, um, I think, Art Fex is on the line, I, I, I hope. Correct. I believe okay. I saw a representative earlier this evening, yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, Lauren, are you doing this presentation? Lauren Rosen. He's logged in, he's muted. Let's see. Lauren has momentarily left his desk. All right. All right. <laughs> Nobody in us. <laughs> All right. We can go to the next application and flip up it or or you have somebody else. No, let's keep moving in order. Although I'm looking and I'm not seeing. Hang on. I'm not seeing. So the next application is 55 Lovely Street. And mm -hmm. are either Steve or Natalie on for 55 Lovely Street? I don't see them. Okay. Okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> There's only one way to get through the agenda system. <laughs> All right. All right. So, Brett Bowen? I'm here. Almost fabulous. Let's go. All right. So this is 15 Farm Spring Road. Okay. Good evening. Hi. Right, good evening. Now, so uh, Shannon and I have been working together with Jacob Reiner and the representatives of 15 uh, Farm Springs to develop the uphouse signage. And we're proposing two building mounted signs, one at the drive through Port Cachere and the other on the uh, building A wing um, as shown in the plans. So there'll be uh, the one, the building A sign will be non illuminated, and the one at the Port Cachere sign B uh, will be illuminated with uh, internally uh, lit uh, halo sign letters as shown in the night view. Oh, so. So this is the uh, old, I probably shouldn't refer to it as, as that, but the, the air, former air, Marriott. The former, yeah, okay. And the signage is where, do we have like mm -hmm. uh, building pictures or, you know? So you pull in where, can you orient us please? Um. Well, so certainly where the cursor is, is the main entry, and you drive through, and you can go then to the uh, 
to the right and around under the porca share where sign B is located. And uh, then you see the elevation where that's the drive through the former main entry of the hotel. Uh, to the left of that is sign A. That's the non-illuminated. This is the A wing. And it's at just at the end of that where we have the up house letters on the side of the building. Sheena, can we make that bigger or no? That's no, it's on the brick. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay, it's on the brick. Thank you. Yeah, it's getting distorted, unfortunately, yeah. but it'll be on the brick portion. Um, Mine's sharper. But yeah, it's all it's all images that have been overlaid and then scanned and whatnot. So it's pixelated. I'm sorry. Um, and that's not an illuminated, right? Correct. Not okay. illuminated. All right, and then this is okay. So this is the and, portico. It's right above. Okay, and that is illuminated a halo effect. So the LEDs will not be visible. Um, directly. Is there anything in the street or no? We have a monument sign that we're working on. Uh, there was some complexity with getting it out of all the easements. There's a sanitary easement uh, back multiple easements. So we withdrew that from our application to get the building signs on because we're getting close to completing the project and we will come back with the monument sign uh, as soon as we can. Okay. So uh, we'll turn, thank you. We'll turn it over to the commissioners. Uh, Patrick, you have any questions about this uh, sign application? Uh, I do not, thank you. Mike? Uh, just on their agenda review, uh, no issues with the two items for consideration, the dimmer switch for the halo lights and uh, the LED diodes facing the wall for halo light dimming, halo lit lighting. That was a yeah. question for the applicant. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, we've agreed to those conditions. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Scott? No questions for me. Thank you. Matt? No questions, thank you. And Liz, let's see what Liz has to say. No questions, okay, good. Um, I have no questions about the uh, signage. Are you guys open yet or? Um, Howard, are you on? Do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, um, yeah, we are open on the A-wing. Okay. A-wing okay. is open. Uh, full, all apartments open? I mean, it's available, but it's not all taken yet. Right, right, right. Okay, no, just that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so A wing, okay, and then uh, what's the date for the B wing with the other amenities? The B wing hopefully will be within a couple of weeks. The amenities is about part of the amenities is about two three. The indoor pool is about two three um, weeks out, and the rest is going to follow right after that. Um, are you still planning on having a restaurant? Yeah, 100%. Oh, we don't know what it is yet? I No, we don't know what it is yet, but um, we do have a lot of traffic going in and out, interested in it now. Okay, great. Great. We can't wait to hear, uh, the, to see the finished product. And um, all right, it sounds like we are ready to take a vote. Uh, I need a motion and a second, please. Uh, yeah, Patrick here, I make the motion to approve the sign application by UR, UR Form LLC, located at 15 Spar, uh, Farm Springs Road, as presented. Second. Scott Hall said I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? We're good. So it's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, Thank and you. For, the, for the record, Liz, uh, Liz voted as well via the chat in the affirmative. Wonderful, thank you. All right, moving right along. The next application is... Um, um, if I can't, I'm gonna go back oh, to, that, I think, sorry. artifacts, if uh, artifacts... Yeah, so are, sorry. That's okay. I, I picked the wrong time to go to the restroom. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Good evening. That's fine, go right ahead. So if you introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hi, uh, my name's Lauren Rosen and I own Artifacts. I'm uh, here representing uh, Udolf Properties at 1449 to 1495 Farmington Avenue. Um, we're here to ask 
if we can remove an existing sign that is 24 square feet and I have a photo of that sign and replace it with a non-illuminated sign that's 20 square feet. Um, I have shop drawings and also um, a photograph of the existing sign to share. Okay, so go ahead. This is the sign, I believe, correct? Uh, that is the sign that's going to be replaced, yes. Okay. And there's ground-mounted lighting, I believe, is that correct? Correct. And it's remaining? Uh, that's going to be remaining. Uh, we intend to remove the fixtures and replace the fixtures mm -hmm. with um, LED fixtures that are approximately uh, 2,500 lumens at 3,000 Kelvin that will be uh, rectangular in shape and aimed uh, toward the sign face. So can I share my screen? No, we don't share screens during our land use meetings. Oh, I'm sorry. Shucks. Um, I have a very good uh, shop drawing here. But anyway, the uh, sign that we're installing is made of aluminum plate. The letters are dimensional. Everything's sprayed with um, low luster epoxy. It's an automotive paint with uh, matte additive. Um, we've used it for many years with very good success. When the sign's done, uh, it pretty much looks like a generic material with a very um, architectural kind of fine finish. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the uh, fabrication. Okay, thank you. All right, Patrick, questions for the applicant? Um, yeah, you said that. It's, so right now, as it stands, it is illuminated. Um, and that well, it's it has external um, illumination that's existing. All right, and and you're going to replace that with the same type of lighting, just LED, right? Um, we are just a more modern fixture, um, just more even lighting. Right now, I think there are quartz lights still that are round and. Uh, you know, they're okay. They're just not uh, specifically geared for this purpose. Okay. And then would you say it's going to be brighter or is it? It's... No, no, I'd say the lighting is pretty subtle. Um, we're, we're going to be about uh, 2,800 to 3,000 lumens, which is, you know, typical of um, ground lighting. Okay. Thank you. No more questions. Thanks, Patrick. Mike? No questions, thank you. Scott? No questions, thank you. Matt? No questions. All right, Liz, sorry, um, Shannon. No, that's fine. Uh, no questions. Okay. Um, I guess, well, Shannon, it's more for you. So the, the size um, is compliant, right, with our regulation? Correct. This uh, lighting, are you comfortable with what you heard? Does it That's fine. Staff will review it. They've got to submit a, a building permit for the install, so staff will review the lighting. It'll, it'll have to be subject to staff review of the lighting fixtures. Uh, I believe you indicated it was 3,000 Kelvin. Is that correct? Approximately 2,800 to 3,000, and we'll get you an exact um, cut of the light style and fabrication when we come down for the permit itself. Okay. Yeah, the 3,000 Kelvin is probably fine. And what's, I know you said 2,500 lumen. Do you know what the wattage is? Uh, the wattage of this, I just have to put my thinking cap on. Um, the wattage would be approximately 35 watts per fixture. 
Okay. Yeah, that should be fine. I don't think so. That's, that's comparable. Issue. Let's say in incandescent terms, um, you you might be like a hundred. That's fine. I think we'll be fine. Just have it as a condition that uh, it's uh, subject to staff review. Thank you. Yeah, because it's a little disjointed for me. Um, but uh, commissioners, um, probably you, um, Patrick, are going to make the motion. Please include the subject to staff review. Uh, and unless commissioners, do you have any questions? I think uh, we're good for a motion in a second. Yeah, Patrick Terrier, I'd like to make the motion to approve the sign application. Um, so yeah, sign application to replace the monument sign um, at 1449-1495 Farmington Avenue with the following condition that there is a there's going to be a staff review of the lighting um, at the time of the building permit. Okay. Second. Scott Halston, I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, opposed? Abstentions, we're good. So uh, you are all set and Shannon, you'll reach out to the applicant? Uh, correct, they'll get a, a letter, they'll be follow up and then they'll uh, submit. And for the record, Liz uh, indicated uh, affirmative for this application as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks Liz, for your time. Absolutely, thank you. Yep. Uh, are applicants for 55 Lovely Street on? Are they, they are, yes, they have, were in under attendee. I got them promoted. So Steve or Natalie, if you could unmute your microphone. And- uh, Hi, everyone. Hello there. Perfect. Okay, if you can, uh, your name and address for the record, please. And then uh, explain what you're looking to do for the commission. And then I can uh, assist with some, some of the logistics and spatial information. Hi, right, good evening, everyone. My name is Steve Joseph. I'm here to represent Classy Jones. We are located at 55 Lovely Street, Unified, Connecticut. And today, we're here to uh, ask for permission to put a sign that will be no more six feet in height. The sign will be two. It will be two sided, uh, with paddle, and the paddle will be affixed to a post with bracket. It will be placed perpendicular to Lovely Street so that people of um, pedestrian and also vehicle traveling from south and um, northbound they can see the sign on the property and as we mentioned east south panel it was, will be 1.5 square feet and area to total, total, total and three feet, uh, square feet of sign and um it will it will not be illuminated and then we counted the measurement from the side well to the the property it is past 12 feet so far that's what we have okay so it's right at the sidewalk or the entrance into the home? E. Yep. Yes. Okay. Six feet. Right. I, I'm sorry. I'm all set. I was just getting uh, my bearings on the, um, the drawing. That's all we have, right, Shannon, for a drawing? Correct. That's so it. that's the, and then the aerial, and then there's the schematic of the sign itself. Okay. All right. Let's uh, turn it over to commissioners for questions. Patrick, you're first. Yeah, so you said it was uh, uh, 12 feet off the sidewalk. Was it 12 feet off the sidewalk or off the road? How far off the curb is it? Off the sidewalk, from the, uh, from the, uh, from the sidewalk to the, uh, to the property, to the yard of the property. Okay, so it's even further, obviously, off, off the... Uh, it looks like it's uh, the sidewalks right up against. Okay. Uh, and then so six feet tall, not illuminated, and then six feet tall to the top of the, the cap. Okay. No, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No more questions. Thank you. No, thank you. Mike? Um, are these wooden signs? Sorry if I missed them. They'll be PVC. Okay. So the, the actual. Circular signs or PVC. The uh the no the I was I was the the post would be PVC but uh the side the would be wooden. Okay. And now the only thing we have reflective, it will be a reflective writing so that even it's not illuminated, you can see it when it's kind of dark outside. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Scott. 
Uh, no questions, thanks. How about you, Matt? No questions, thank you. All right, and um, Liz, Shannon, I'm looking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, no questions from Liz. Okay, D so does it have to be six feet? Which, um, I would say um, anything that will put us under um, TVZ compliant, if it has to be 5.8, 5.9, as per the um uh, the regulation, we say that it has to be under six feet. So therefore, we try to leave that is just to be um uh, to be in a window to be compliant. Shannon, help me out. So the six feet is compliant for the sign, given that there are two sign panels. He, there's going to be some clearance room that's needed at the top and bottom of the sign. It is set back from the road because you can see here perhaps a little easier in the aerial. Yep. The road at roadway edge of Lovely Street, right? The white light, the white stripe sign. The sidewalk coming through is the is the grayish because it's a bituminous sidewalk. Uh, and then the yellow is the approximation of where the property line is falling for, as you look at it on the aerial. And then this sidewalk is the sidewalk. So there's stairs and then sidewalk up. This portion of the home, there's actually a retaining wall here. And then as you continue north, this retaining wall dies out and comes to grade where the driveway is on the neighboring property. Um, but it is set set up and back. It's a little, um, it's a little different, uh, if you will, from a siting standpoint. I had to meet Mr. Joseph out there at the property to try to look at this and figure it out together. Um, and certainly as you're coming from the south, uh, the hedgerow, the existing hedgerow has been trimmed back, but he has a row of arborvitae, small arborvitae at this point that are in. Uh, some of the existing hedgerow remains uh, on the neighboring property, uh, which means you're not really picking up the sign from a line of sight till you're okay. you know, in the, in the vicinity here. Looking to the south, you can see all the way, um, you know, as you're standing here, you can see to the intersection, but the signs won't be big enough that they'll really be um, legible from the intersection. So uh, given the size and the, um, again, that there's, there's two businesses that have been approved here and trying to accommodate both of them in a reasonable fashion, I... Uh, that's, I get it. that's what we that's where we landed with it yeah no i understand and it, it was really the site part that was bugging me but i understand it and um thank you for your time and i'll uh, going out there also to making sure that it fits the neighborhood and you're right we did approve the businesses already thank you that's the side door camera. sorry for that. all right thank okay. you sure. i'm happy to have you um so commissioners um Unless we have any last minute questions, I think we're ready for a motion and a second. We're good. Okay, so motion it and a second, please. Oh uh, yeah, Patrick here. I'd like to make a motion to approve the sign application by Steve Joseph, located at 55 Lovely Street for home business located in R20 zone. Scott Halston, I second. Everyone know what we're voting on? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, it's unanimous. You are all said, Mr. Joseph. You'll be uh, hearing from Shannon and staff. Thank you guys for, for taking the time to hear my presentation, and thank you very much. We will we'll, we'll appreciate it. God bless you guys. Thank yeah. you. Take care. And just for the record, Liz also voted uh, in the affirmative for this application. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, Shannon. What a, what a team. Exactly. What a team. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank, all thank of you. you. You got it. Thank you. All right. I am not sure why I can't read my own. All right. The next one is an application from, I, yeah, FPK LLC. It's a site plan approval for outdoor patio at a property located at 1019 Farmington Avenue. And who do we have? I believe we have the property owner on. Yes. Perfect. Hi there. Uh, can you, are you? Intro okay. introduce yourself, uh, your name and, and address, and then explain what you're looking to do, please. Okay, my name is Costa Buzakis. I'm the owner of the property at 1019 Farmington Avenue, as well as the owner of Farmington Pizza and Kitchen. Uh, 
what I'd like to do is we put a patio on the side of our building uh, this past summer uh, and basically talking to Shannon and Garrett we have I have to come into compliance a little bit with uh, zoning so I'm more than happy to do that uh, what we're planning on doing is replacing the current wooden fence next to the patio along the Dunkin Donuts uh, our property line with a six foot fence to give privacy uh, we're also gonna put uh, pear trees in accordance to the diameter three to separate the property line where the cars park and Dunkin' Donuts driveway is. Uh, we could put any trees that the town allows, but my landscaper, uh, KDM Services, says are, those are nice uh, white flowering trees in the springtime and they don't get you know, too big to have problems with the roots and stuff like that with the driveway or foundation or anything. Uh, we're also in compliance on the thing to not have any type of advertisements outside in the patio. Uh, and this other question he has, again, be any type of outdoor lighting. As of now, we're just trying to get into compliance with what we put there and not even think about lighting. And I see in the notes that if and when the time comes, we'll have another meeting with, with the people on board here. Uh, the one problem I am having is trying to get a hold of Francis Worth, who's the owner of Dunkin' Donuts. I've sent several emails and phone calls to get uh, his permission. He did it for Demetrius Toledis, the previous owner, to allow my employees to park along the, the side of our property where the patio is and his parking lot. Um, and that's, that's the only fallback I have right now. Let's just try to get a hold of him and to get an email or a letter uh, to continue the permission for us to do that based on the parking spaces. So you're not using the patio right now as it stands, right? Because no, uh, the permission. No. Okay. No, nope, it's a seasonal thing. Um, majority of our business is delivery and takeout with Uber Eats and everything like that. Um, when I bought the building, it was little rundown from the previous owner, so I try to spruce it up a little bit, not thinking of what I did, but uh, right now the patio is not being used. It is it is a seasonal, probably won't be used until April or so. Okay. Is, um, uh, Shannon, can you throw up GIS for everyone so we know which building we're talking about? I can. Thank you. See, I might have an aerial in here. Hang on. Uh, wrong application. Hang on. Let me see if I've got I've got photos there it in is. here. Okay. All right. All right. Let me grab uh JS. Thank you. Yep. I'm assuming you can see that. Yep. Okay. Driving pretty fast. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's all good. Uh, so here's the 1019 Dunkin' Donuts and the a drug strike thing. Okay. And the patio is where um, you had a parking, right? For Pat staff? Patio is right here. Okay. And that's where staff used to park, or am I totally missing? No. The so there were trees there, large maple trees that were going into the foundation. So I cut them down and we put the patio there. My staff parks, uh, Shannon had a picture of like where the little shed is. Mm -hmm. It allows people to park in there. It's like a little grass lot. Okay. This patio, was it paved before or was it just grass? It was uh, just grass. Okay. So the white vinyl fence that I mentioned will be replacing this wooden fence here. Okay. And it'll be, it'll be six feet tall to give privacy between Dunkin' Donuts. And then if you look at the lower picture where it has uh, 
a grass area. I'm sorry, if you go up above the shed, sorry. Right here where it just shows the uh, mulch area there. Yep. That's where I plan on putting the three pear trees in the spring with some seasonal flowers just to give a nice curb appeal. Okay. And your, um, and I, I should probably turn it over. And your parking right now, where? You have a small parking lot in the front. And then, yep. and for Dunkin', you need permission from Dunkin' Donuts to use some of the parking. Is that what we're saying? Yes, due to the extended seating in the patio, uh, we have eight parking spaces. Two mm -hmm. are used for the clothing store, the trunk show. Yep. Uh, she's open Wednesday through Friday from 11 to 4 or by appointment only. So there's never really too much people in there. Um, Dunkin' Donuts prime time. The managers come over for food and stuff like that. Uh, their prime time is in the morning where ours really isn't until six o'clock at night on Fridays or Saturdays. So it's difference in, in busy hours, which is nice. Uh, so there hasn't been any type of issues or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go with questions uh, from commissioners. Patrick? Yeah, so the dumpsters that are going to be, those are going to be located uh, behind the new, newly installed white six-foot fence, right? So right now you can see them, but you, you'll, that'll be hidden. Is that correct? It'll be, hit, it'll be hidden, yes. And yep. are, are those like shared dumpsters or is that the Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, no, Dunkin' Donuts, is, those are mine there. So we're planning on putting the white fence so you won't see it from the street or from the patio. Dunkin' Donuts dumpsters are to the left of mine. Same, same for the vicinity. Okay. And currently you have an agreement with Dunkin' Donuts to use the parking, but it's like a verbal thing. Is that what I understand? And, and you're just trying to get that in writing? Well, Dimitri uh, had a written one. Uh, Dimitri owned the building prior to myself purchasing from him. Uh, and just the, the town just wants to see, since I knew ownership now, just to make sure it's okay that we continue doing what we've been doing for all these years. Which okay. I'm more than happy to do. And you're confident that you're going to be able to get that, I'm assuming, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, the management there is awesome. They come in all the time. You know, we have a great relationship with them. They bring us donuts. We give them pizza. It's a good, uh, good, good trading system there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then the um, so the you have the three three uh, presumably pear trees or whatever it ends up in there, and then that's just going to be mulched again. Have you thought about what you're going to put around those trees? Yeah, mulch again. Uh, definitely flowers and stuff like that. Seasonal flowers. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. No more questions. Thanks, Patrick. Mike. Um. So. Are you looking for an agreement with Dunkin' Donuts for your employees only to park there? Or are you looking for an agreement to have your customers park there as well? I'm just looking for a continuation of the, the agreement that we've had uh, that sometimes customers do park along the property line of Dunkin' Donuts just because it's easier to get in and out since their parking lot with the dry cleaners is so much bigger mm -hmm. uh, than my parking lot. Uh, but most of the time, people just pull up along the property line there. Yeah. They're not actually using Dunkin' Donuts parking spaces that he has painted in front of his building. They're just lining up, especially a lot of landscapers that come in with their trailers. It's hard to come into my parking lot, so they might just line up there and then take off, grab a coffee, grab some food, and then yeah. you know, the road. So, so the seven parking spaces you would have would allow for 14 um, maximum seats in use. So we have 14 outside or 14 inside or yes. seven and seven. How would you police that? It's, I don't believe it's going to be a problem. We never have 90% uh, of our business is takeout. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to do something nice next to that sure. building uh, that if people did want to sit there. So I'm assuming during a nice time in the summer, they won't be sitting inside. They'll be sitting outside, but um if you have any recommendations how to police it, you know, I could take my indoor seats out during nice days or monitor somehow. Yeah. We, we really don't have that big of a dining crowd that sits into our, at our place. Gotcha. 
we're not known you know, we're not known as like you know a sit down dining area we're more known for yeah i mean i certainly know that dunkin donuts closes quite early now compared to when it used to and uh, yeah you know yeah. your prime time is probably gonna be at night if you have people so right um shannon could you just go back to the gis real quick of course so where i see people parking is that that 8227 plot is that owned by 1015 farms avenue uh yes it is the same owner okay all right uh just curiosity question um that was all i have thank you thanks mike scott no my questions were asked i'm all set thank you you got it matt i'm all set thank you and liz Oh, sorry. <laughs> I gotta remember. No questions. We're all good. Okay. I um as you were describing the way um the parking lot is used now where people are just pulling on the side. Do you have some kind of ballard? Like what's the safety? You know, so there's gonna be a fence, but what is there in place if like a car you know doesn't stop or whatever? Like, there's a there's a curb there between the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot and that, there's a there's an eight inch curb that runs alongside the property. You could probably see it in that picture a little bit. It runs all the way down. Are we okay with that, Shannon? Yeah, I mean, the building's not getting hit. Right now there's nothing there and I mean, the folks are pulling up adjacent to the building. I don't know that, um, you know, with the fence that provides a visual barrier in addition to the curb i i don't know that this creates uh any more of an issue and there'll be trees so right now there's no trees there and that this berms up a little bit okay. so uh there'll be three trees in here and then the start uh at this point of a six foot stockade fence so um you know anything's possible we have people run into buildings so uh right. but at, at some point we've you know, got to look at reasonable measures. And I think there's reasonable measures with curb trees and fence in place. And with how, how can we uh, vote on this application without having the required notice from the other business? Uh, that's fine. You can just make it a condition of approval. Uh, again, it is, uh, uh, Costa indicated the, Staff's looking for it. There is one in the record from 1997 when um, the prior owner went through and, and did this work and ex did some uh, expansion work and required then additional parking and got the agreements in place. So uh, I don't see why this wouldn't be the same. And quite honestly, it's been going on for um, quite some time. Farmington Pizza Kitchen has been in place for couple of years now uh, since the ownership's changed hands. So um, it, it's really at this uh, a formality for us so that we know that they, the capacity is there from a seating standpoint. Um, but I think it's fine as a condition of approval. Okay, that that works. Uh, I mean, that, uh, you know, where Naples is, like, that, that's a disaster with parking. Um, so hopefully this is not creating a problem with having additional space. I mean, I wish you all all the best, and it it's a really nice spot for outdoor patio. But uh, I just want to make sure we're not creating any other problems. But um, unless um, commissioners, we want to have a discussion. I think uh, we should um, have a condition that uh, we need something in writing on file with Dunkin' Donuts. You guys okay with it? Yep. Okay. All right. Unless there are any more questions, let's make. Make it, um, let's do the motion and second. Just one more question. So yes. are we good? Because I'm about, I'm going to make the motion. So that, Thank you. Did, we, did we cover the table umbrellas? Um, so I know we talk, talked about most of it, like the lighting. Uh, we did talk about that it shouldn't exceed, but it's it sounds like there's good, there is no lighting at this point, correct? Correct. Okay. And then you're comfortable with, are you familiar? So you were reading off that list? Um, yes. That we have. Okay. And you're comfortable yeah. with that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so I think that was it, right? We pretty much yeah. covered everything. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So let me find where I am here. 
You All can right. just make those six items a condition, Patrick, if you'd like. Okay, so just, okay, so the six items, so I don't have to read them out. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so Patrick Carrier, I'd like to make a motion to approve the site plan um, uh, presented by FPK LLC, located at 1019 Farmington Avenue for outdoor patio area with the six items on the agenda review as conditions of approval. That works, second. Scott Halstead, I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right, you are all set. Thank you all so yeah. much. Thank you. Perfect. I appreciate Thank everyone's you. time. Thank you. You got it. And, and Liz is a yes for the record. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Shannon. All right, uh, moving right along, um, we have another site plan um, application uh, for a garage uh, from Ray M. Co. at 62 Spring Lane. And who do we have? Oh, uh, who do we got? Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Ben Hildebrand. Hi there. Um, I work with Ferrell Engineering, and uh, I'm here on behalf of Ramco. Uh, this project's located at 62 Spring Lane and zoned industrial CR. We are proposing to construct a 3,600 square foot storage building for use as vehicle storage. Uh, the building will be metal panel and slab on grade construction. We have responded to comments back from engineering on January 30th and also have since received additional comments back on uh, February 9th. Uh, these latest comments are uh, fairly minor in nature. Uh, that wouldn't require any significant uh, changes to the plans, and we would have no issue uh, incorporating them as conditions of, of approval. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, so do you want to just go over like the height or so, uh, or Shannon, can you drive the, so yeah. All right, so it's a garage, it's going on a slab. We have some overhead doors. Is this taller than the actual building, the factory building or no? It is slightly taller, yes. But we, we did send revised uh, elevations. So these are accurate to, to what uh, we are proposing. Shannon, have you guys seen them? Uh, yes, yeah, so these um, these came in I'm sorry, Ben. When did they came in today? Right today, yeah, uh, today. Yes, I'm trying to remember. Uh, yeah. These came in today, so I just loaded these into um, into Zoom, Madam Chair. I apologize. I did not, given the the that they came in at, after Friday, I did not redistribute them back out to the commission. Um, but it looks like, uh, and Ben, chime in if I've got if I misspeak, but it looks like the, the top of building is, there's a measurement to an eave of some sort. There's a parapet. I believe the top of building or top of parapet is approximately 16 feet um, for the existing building. Mm -hmm. This new garage that's going to sit out front on the south end has a peak elevation of 21 and a half feet. Correct. And the yep. Eve is 14 feet. So your your midline um, of this is still it's uh, it's, uh seven, about seven, so seven, so we do 17 uh, 17 to 18 feet. So it's a the midline of this is a, a foot to foot and a half a foot and a half to two feet taller than that existing building uh, mm -hmm. that's sitting behind that you can see. Um, so that's. You know, that's what it's going to look like from the south. So if I flip back to the uh, site plan, this is where it's sitting. So here's Spring Lane. Yep. Uh, this is heading north on Spring North is basically the top of the page. This is the existing building. There's a two entrances. The northern entrance comes into their visitors area and front end office. And then the south entrance is deliveries and the day-to-day uh, the -day working. Um, operations. Um, and so. the neighbors or other um, businesses, or we don't, I don't think we have residential here, right, at all? Correct. We can do this real easy here. Thank you. No problem.
we can do it no problem when Shannon can drive to the right location. Here we go. Um, so here's 62. Yep. Okay, I'm just going to zoom out just a smidge. And you can see it's all industrial down both sides of Spring Lane. Okay. And we'll see if the zoning, yeah, the zoning layer comes on. And so it's yep. commercial on both sides. You don't get to residential till you go across the street of Spring Lane on the other side. Um, so there's okay. there's no immediate residential around 62 Spring Lane. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right. Anything else or uh, we can turn it over for questions? Okay. It sounds like that was the presentation. Thank you. Patrick, questions? Um, yeah, so when we're looking at this picture here, um, where is the gable end of that building? Is it to, is that south going down? I don't know where the... Correct. Right. South is yes, to the correct. bottom of the page. Yep. Yeah. So that's it right there. That's, that's the gable end of it? Yeah, that would be the gable end. The two sides would be would be the eaves. Okay. Yep, exactly. Yep. Okay. And then so at one point it was saying that it was 10 feet tall. So so you guys reduced the height of that? Did I get that correct? No, honestly, I, I think it was just a mistake on the plans and we've since revised it to be accurate to, to what we're actually proposing. I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know how those dimensions made on the plans initially. So what the new plans are are accurate to the height. And Shannon, can you go back to the new plans? Of course I will. Yeah, I mean, it so, so I can zoom in. This is the south elevation. So that's looking at the gable end, looking looking north at the south end of the uh, building. Okay, so the so the peak now is so you're at so the main building itself is probably like one one sixteen or so. Correct. So yeah, so you're seven something. That's where you got that number. Okay. Okay, I was just trying to understand it. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Mike? If you could just refresh my memory from 2019, where was that, um, the addition approved for on the, uh, on the plan? I think I got a pick there. There you go. There's no. a picture of it. Way at the end of the plan set, gotcha. which probably nobody got to. Yeah. Which um, I understand. <laughs> do we know if this is still moving forward or? Oh, Ben, can you comment on that or somebody from Rainco? As as far as I know, yes, they, they still would like to build that addition. I, I don't have an exact time frame right now, but it, it is definitely um, something they'd like to do. Okay. All right. I have uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Scott? Uh, no questions for me. Thank you. All right. And Matt? No, no questions. Thank you. Sure. And Liz? Um... No questions for Liz on this. Okay. Everything uh, I wanted to ask, I did, or somebody else did. Um, it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, thank you for explaining the roof lines and everything and the location. Let's see what else is in here. Okay. Yeah. So um, clearly working with town staff, um, you're comfortable with that condition, Shannon? Uh, so they, we would like the conditions um, that the comments from February 9th be addressed. And uh, staff was suggesting some screen, some evergreen screening. Well, there's a tree line that's shown on this plan. Um, it, there's not, currently there are not dense plant uh, plantings there. Um, you can see it's there. Yeah. somewhat sparse here. This tree obviously is coming out because this is where the, the new building is going to go. So the thought is, and I don't even think all of these, this is the, the latest area we have available, but I think some of these have since been removed. So the thought is just to get some screening in here. So be, since it's going to be a sheet metal building, it's not, and I granted it's an industrial area, but um, the thought was a few plantings in here would help soften the look of that uh, building. We, we would be okay with that. If you want it along that, that driveway, you know, that loading zone there, I think that might make the most sense. Yeah, somewhere in that area. So um, we could submit a plan for approval. And as long as you guys are okay with it, then that, that's what we'll move forward with. 
how, what that, uh, Shannon, what would that look like? So we approve the addition or the site plan modification, and then you would send us an email with the proposed plantings or like, what are we doing? So it could be, it could just be a condition of approval. So unless, uh, you know, if the commission's overly curious and I can bring it back under planner's report when it comes in to show what the plantings will be, but I'd say just a mix of evergreens along this line. It doesn't need to be a row, you know, just a row of arborvitae, but we can get a mix of uh, pine and spruce through here that should yep. um, do the trick. And I don't even know that it needs to be a solid row. It's again, we're not screening it from a residential use. Right. It's simply, you know, to kind of soften the appearance of it. So uh, it's a little, it, I would look at it a little differently than if it was immediately adjacent to a residential property. Yep, I, I agree. Um, commissioners, are we comfortable with that? Okay, I'm faking silence as yes. All right, I do not have any other questions. So we need a motion with a couple of these things in there and a second. Yeah, Patrick here. I'd like to make a motion to approve the site plan application by Rainco located at 62 Spring Lane for a garage addition with the following conditions that the updated staff comments dated February 9th, 2023 be addressed to town staff satis satisfaction and um, that the applicant work with town staff for uh, the screening buffer between accessory garage and spring lane. Nice job. Second? Got all so I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, you are all set. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Have a nice night. You too. And I saw Liz was a yay. And <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's all good. I'm getting it by the fifth application, right? <laughs> all right. And then uh, we have two more items for new business. We are accepting two applications. Uh, the first one is uh, from Amco Development LLC. And we need a motion uh, to accept the application, please. Uh, yeah, Patrick Carrier. I'd like to make the motion um, to accept the application by Amco Development LLC, located at Lot 8572 Oakland Avenue, for special permit to construct home in excess of 2,200 square feet in an R9 OG zone, and schedule a public hearing with a recommended hearing date of March 13th, 2023. Second. Scott Hall, so I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, application has been accepted. All right, and I need uh, someone to make a motion to accept the application from Carrier Group, Inc., please. Yep, Scott Halstead, I'd like to make a motion to accept the application from Carrier Group, Inc. for a 25 lot cluster subdivision at lots 8517 and 8518 uh, Morea Road and to schedule a public hearing with a recommended hearing date of March 13, 2023. Second. Michael Bull, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that application has been accepted also. I almost wrote I'd on like this. To, I would, yes. I'm going to note for the record that Patrick Carrier did not participate in that vote. Please, yep. thank you. Yep, you got it. Thank you. Makes yep. sense. Okay, um, so that was the new business portion of and our- I'm going to do, so sorry, I'm jumping in. Uh, Liz yeah. Sanford also uh, is noted as an I in the chat feature in for thank both you. item six and item seven. Sorry, thank you. Yep, mm -hmm. you got it, thank you. Yep. Okay, now we can- All right, <laughs> yeah, all good, all good. Um, we're actually doing okay with time. So the um, new business items are all handled. Um, now we're going to open up. Uh, the meeting to the public hearing portion, and we have a couple items in front of us. Um, so the applicant applicant presents to the commissioner. The commissioners have a chance to ask questions. Um, when we're done asking questions, uh, we open it up to the public, to whomever in our case may have called in to ask questions, or if it's a in opposition or support of a project. And uh, then we close the public hearing portion. And if we're satisfied, we vote on the matter. So anyway, uh, two items are in front of us. The first one is an application from Michael 
Reiner. It's for a special permit for food court use at 17 Talkett Notch Road, BR Zone. And who do we have? I believe we have Brett Bowen up again. Uh, yeah, hi, Michael's good evening. On, uh, okay. and, <laughs> go ahead, Mike. I'm also on the line, Mike Reiner. Okay. Uh, Mike Reiner for the applicant. Um, you have the narrative. What we're this is about a thirty thousand square foot two story office building on Talcott Notch Road in Farmington and towards the rear of the building, away from Farmington Avenue. There's approximately thirty two hundred square feet of space that we would like to uh, turn into a food court. It has its own separate entrance. Uh, for for use, uh, the parking uh, <clears throat> plan and pictures that we submitted will show that uh, despite the fact that uh, there are several tenants in the building, uh, the parking lot is and remains uh, vastly underutilized <clears throat> during the day and evening uh, because of the tenant uh, composure to begin with. And then, of course, with COVID even uh, uh, the parking is is used to a, a lesser degree. Uh, the intent of the food court is to provide uh, bays of six or seven um, uh, total bays, and one of them would be open for breakfast, uh, uh, coffee and breakfast items. The rest would be open for uh, lunch and dinner. We expect that uh, most of the people will come and do takeout uh, and and uh, it would not provide a, a great uh, parking burden. <clears throat> Despite that, however, we are going to put six parking spaces very close to the entrance to this area for uh, pickup of, of food. Uh, I, I would like to note that in this area, uh, my office is in this, uh, not in this building, but in another building on Talcott Notch Road, and we've seen a steady stream of restaurants going out of business, and virtually everyone in all of these office complexes wind up traveling to West Hartford Center to get food or order uh, from Uber Eats or some other delivery service. So we feel this is a very a needed area for the community, both the office community, as well as the residential community around. Okay. Uh, um, anything else or just the, what well, we have? I, for, for I, I know that, yeah. I know that there are uh, some conditions uh, that were pointed out by uh, uh, Shannon and we have no problem with with the conditions that have been proposed. Is is this the first building? Like, if you come into Talkit, um from Farmington, it's off the street. It's not the first building Sorry. off of Farmington Avenue. It's uh, it's it's you actually access it through a side street. Um, but it's from uh, on the okay on top of right. this It's the, the second one. building. Okay. It's the yep. second building. Yeah, it's yeah. accessed from Talcott Forest Road, which is the first left off of Talcott Notch Road. Got it. Yep, and it's right there, and it's existing building, and we're modifying the first floor only. That is correct. Yeah. Um. I think as part of this, just as a technicality, we are seeking from the total parking count a 25% uh, waiver of parking. Again, looking at the, the, the parking lot pictures were taken midday uh, that were, were given to the town and it shows a, a ostensibly more than half vacant parking lot with the number of parking spaces that are there, which is substantial. I, I think we have a hundred and 13 spaces uh, in at the building. Okay. Well, um, thank you. Um, Shannon, does it make sense to uh, flow through our questions and then maybe we'll probably have more? Or Certainly. Yep. I think okay. that's fine. Go right. through that and then we'll, we can take right. public comment. And obviously, if anyone has questions for me, that's fine too. All right. Thank you. All right, Patrick. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, so um, how much of the first floor was getting renovated again? About 3,300 square feet. Out of how many square feet? 
The building is around 32,000 square feet. Oh, and that's two floors, right? So, so on one two floor. Two floors. Okay. Okay. And then there's, uh, in that, in that, I just, there's, there's some space that's unusable. This was a single tenant building uh, that was built to suit for an aerospace business. So there's spaces within the building, a lot of common areas that just are, are can't be utilized. So it's, it's not even quite as big for usable as, uh, as it sounds. Yeah, and then I'm so I'm looking at the print now. So it's so how many different restaurants? So it looks like each one of those could be potentially a different restaurant. Is that how that? Yes, correct? that's what we intend to do. We're going to be, uh, in fact, building the small kitchens for them. It's it's very similar to the concept that's very popular at Parkville Market in Hartford. This the same idea. It'll be each stall, each each area will have a different kind of cuisine. Okay, and have you have you been in, uh, in contact with anybody that has any interest, or is this something that you're going to build it and then start to uh, advertise it? I guess. Well, we we've I've spoken to quite a number of prospective tenants, and many are very interested in it. Obviously, without seeing it, it no one's ready to sign a lease. Once we have right. the plans up and start going, I I think it will be very popular. It would typically, uh, I I would expect it to be a second or third location for a restaurant that that wants to expand and then uh so there's quite a bit of offices around so are you, are you anticipating that there's going to be a lot of people walking um to this area is it close I, enough I, it is close enough uh and as i said there really is uh, other than butchers and bakers in this area there is nothing left in fact uh all the yukon uh uh people who used to come early and go to the Dunkin' Donuts that was at what was called Loman's Plaza that's been vacant for a while. And there's a huge vacuum in the area of, of this kind of service. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. No more questions. Thanks, Patrick. Mike? So my question was whether you were going to you know, contract with a food service company or you're looking for independent businesses. Um, Certainly, as you mentioned, Parkville Market's very popular, and my concern would be that we get too popular when it comes to parking. Um, Ms. Shannon, when when you went there and did the the hundred or hundred and one parking mm -hmm. uh, spot, where was it actually empty? It, it was, it wasn't, uh, so um, Garrett and Bruce went and took a number of photos. So it was fairly um, vacant. Uh, it was similar to what you, the photos that I just uh, yeah. put up on the screen that uh, the applicant had shared. So that seems to be fairly reflective. Um, additionally, um, when we, obviously those are nighttime, which isn't quite as relevant. Um, but uh, when we take a look at the site plan back in uh, early 2000, I believe, 2007, the, the site plan, there was a modification done that was never um, uh, constructed for additional parking. And it was restriping the parking on the backside uh, to compact spaces and then removing landscaping uh, immediately adjacent to the building and adding in additional parking spaces enough to bring it up uh, according to this plan to 128 whether we'd quite get to 128 I'm somewhat suspect but nonetheless um, there is room on an approved plan so that's one of the provisions of a waiver, if you're going to uh, construct uh, up to 25% less of the required parking, that it's at least demonstrated on a plan that it can be constructed, which I think we have a reasonable um, representation of that here, um, if needed, or perhaps um, you know, expansion of, of some parking. There is a 100 foot buffer zone um, off of Talcott Notch. I'd have to look into them seeing that here on the plan now. I'd have to look into the requirements of that. But there's perhaps opportunity for optimization of parking and certainly what's demonstrated here on this 
this plan from uh, say 2000, I can't remember the last update, 2008, uh, 2007, I was right, 2007. Okay, I think this is great. And I probably go there myself for lunch. I just, my only concern would be it becomes too popular. Um, and you have cars parking on Talca Forest, which is a very narrow roadway. I, I do like in the agenda review, um, you know, we can certainly review this once the food court is fully open to see if it is in fact a, a uh, high demand. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good questions, Mike. Scott? Yeah, thank you. Just a, a question about the capacity, the seating capacity in the food court. I may have missed it. We're, we're putting uh, 24 is what we have for capacity. Again, we don't expect this is a food court type thing. You would, it, it, we expect it to be more takeout or going back to your office during during the day. So it, minimal for sitting down and eating, more okay. of a convenience. All right, that's all I had. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Matt? Yeah, just two for me. Is there any plans for outdoor seating? Eventually, we may come back to you uh, for that. We There are no plans right now. Uh, the, the, there are a few picnic tables that are already at the, at the uh, office for the tenants' use, but we, we don't have plans for a formal patio that would be necessary for outdoor seating for, for this sort of use. Got it. Thank you. Uh, second one. So you mentioned that maybe I missed this uh, new exhaust hoods, right, for the food cook lines. Is there any new one, like new rooftop units or anything like that to accommodate sort of now the first floor being a food court? And then two, what would the second floor feel like with, you know, a food court and, you know, eight different sort of mini restaurants on the first floor? I, I don't know exactly what we plan for exhaust fans. Brett may be able to answer that. Uh, we, we obviously are very concerned about the tenants uh, and whether or not uh, they're, we're, we're concerned about the smell and any other concerns they had. All of the tenants in the building wanted us to go forward with these plans. So the execution, of course, would be the hoods to make sure that they don't smell the uh, any of the foods as we as as tenants move in and, and start preparing food. There. So all the uh, hoods are aligned to uh, run the exhaust directly to the exterior of the building. And currently there's a uh, uh, eave structure at the first floor. And we're imagining that the hoods will be projected out a few feet from that and covered with a similar brake metal system or corrugated metal panel to allow the mushroom fans to be hidden obstructed but project out to keep the odors moving away from the building and uh, be masked from the tenants and uh, invisible hopefully from the uh, second floor so those would come out the side of the building Brett? correct correct uh, it, where there's current uh, right above the glazing okay. in that Got it. So not answered the system so not on the roof, on the side. Correct. Okay. And so then it would be screened to visually try to blend with the building. Correct. That's our thinking. We'll have to draw it up architecturally. Okay. All right, great. No, no additional questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. Liz? Uh, uh, no questions. Oh. No questions from Liz. Okay. No questions. Uh, so just this the uh, exhaust that we just talked about Shannon mm -hmm. you know we had recently an applicant that uh, there were uh, limitations for the exhaust well the, the exhaust was completely missed from mm -hmm. what was presented right and then there were limitations where it could be placed mm -hmm. I, I don't want to have the same situation so I think we've got a few things to our advantage, given the the roof and that this is going to be on the first floor and not a second floor food court um, and the type of roof structure, these aren't coming up to the roof. 
Um, Correct. So they're going to be lower and tucked in under the eave, uh, and they've agreed to screen them. We also have the added benefit of a 100-foot buffer off of Talcott Notch. So when you look at the building, um, because the food, uh, from a, a plan standpoint, the food court's up in this, I'm going to say upper left corner. Is that correct, gentlemen? That's correct. It, that is correct, yes. Okay. So when we look at that here, right, it's up against, um, we, we've got that, the, the buffer and the and the parking area. So we're back, we're into this portion of the building with the wooded buffer and the parking. So um, a little different than, thankfully, than being right on Farmington Avenue. So we've got a little more, um, sure. a little more natural screening. And then of course, with it coming out the side, there's a desire on their part to have it blend aesthetically with the building. Okay. What will the hours be? We expect uh, one uh, tenant to be open for coffee and breakfast, and then the other is 11.30 until probably 8 o'clock. So to the point of the parking, the lunch crowd, which I expect people walking to it or close by, I don't expect there to be a lot of traffic for the lunch and then the dinner, the office tenants, those that were there during the day would be gone. And then the parking lot is really quite empty by five o'clock. Okay, so what what time in the morning again? Six or seven, I'd say six o'clock probably. If, if it's successful as we think, we'll be capturing. I know that Dunkin' Donuts, when it was open, started earlier operations there at around six o'clock to uh, meet the demands of the of the neighborhood. And you mentioned 8 p.m. cutoff or closing? Yes, yes. Monday through or seven days a week? We would not have, a, we don't, don't anticipate having a, a, a day that's closed unless the, the tenant wants to close. Um, so, uh, uh, Shannon, I'm sorry, I don't uh, I mean to sound a little crazy like this. So what does that mean for lighting for eight? Like anyone else stay? I know butchers and bakers, obviously, but, um, who else is around till eight? Most of the office buildings will probably be vacant by then, right? Most of the office buildings I'd have to, I'm, a lot of them leave some ancillary lights on, though, from a security standpoint, because you never know when somebody's working late. Um, yeah. So it's it's typically not pitch black. There's lobby lights left on and, and not necessarily full parking lights, but some of the building lights. Um, uh, there's residents behind. Uh, but again, as I'm looking at this, there's a decent wooded area. If I take a quick... This is going to let me do this. I'll take a quick measurement from the edge of parking to the nearest. You're about 100 feet, roughly, to the nearest residence. So I don't think 8 o'clock certainly isn't, um, you know, an unreasonable hour. Right. If it was midnight, I think it would be a different conversation. But at right. 8 o'clock, I don't think okay, that's so unreasonable. 6 to 8 daily. Um it sounded like all food. There's no um, any plans for any live music at this point. No, no. Um, have there been uh, Shannon any comments received um, from neighbors about us? Uh, none that I am aware of. I don't believe we've received any written comment. Um, Sandy, can you confirm? I don't know. She's no, we have next. not. Okay. okay. All right. So that's it for questions. Commissioners, do you have any questions be before we turn it over to the public? Madam Chair, Michael Bowles, just a yes. quick question. Um, the, the church. Mm. Can, could you remind me what the expectation was for um, weekend, how many people yeah. they anticipated? The only, I obviously, would see a, a conflict. Yeah. Know? If they expect to use 100, you know, we approved them for 100 to use 100 parking spaces on a Sunday and 
at one o'clock and the food court's operating at the same time. The, the church has never used the back parking lot on a Sunday. They, they haven't even filled up the front. Uh, it's busy. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, you, see the, you see a parking lot that's used on Sunday. It's not that it's a few cars, but they're not even using the entire front. Right, right now. Okay. Uh, Shannon, you don't remember, do you? Or have no, I'm trying to, I want to say, so, because there was, um, there were classes in the evening and then Sunday service, but I want to say that the congregation was 60 members or something to that effect. And it's quite a small congregation. I, recall. I just didn't remember. And I, I yeah, I don't, it was like an executive drive thing or, well. Okay. No, no, this is much smaller. And you can see even on the schematic plan, um, it's 1300, you know, 1300 square feet uh, for the actual church space. And then I know there's some ancillary space in the in the lobby, I think was carved out a little reception or, or area, if I recall. Is that correct, Mike? We haven't even done that yet. They've been utilizing the space we're now talking about for their office. Um, Oh, this space has been their office, uh, the food court. Yes, this is the food court space. Okay, so some things are going to get shuffled around as part of all of this then to match. Yeah, I don't Possibly, I, yeah. Okay, but uh, nonetheless, I don't think, I don't, I don't foresee that being a, uh, a okay. concern. And do you know how long, when on Sundays, how long are they there? It's just, it's not an all day no, thing. they're out before the dinner time. They're out by about 3, 3.30. So okay. Sunday, maybe there'd be an overlap for lunch. But if I were to guess, I would guess that if a, if one of these court food courts would be closed, it would be on Sundays. Maybe someone would come in for dinners, but I think Sunday lunch would probably be the, 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 the time that they would want to close. Okay. All right. I'm good with that. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. All right, Shannon. Let's uh, let's see if there's anyone that has called in uh, regarding this application. Certainly. So, if uh, if you've called in to offer comment regarding the uh, application at 17 Talcott Notch Road for a food court, please raise your hand using the feature in Zoom, and you will be acknowledged to address the commission. One more time, if anyone's called in to offer comment regarding the uh, application at 17 Talcott Notch Road for a food court use in the office building, please raise your hand using the feature in Zoom. Madam Chair, there are no hands raised. Okay. Commissioners, do we have any um, last minute questions before I close the public hearing? Yeah, Madam Chair, I do. One, one thing... What about dumpsters? Um, I know that with food courts, there's, there's grease dumpsters and so on and so forth. Has, has there been any thought put into that? I know that's quite, it probably produces a lot more garbage and stuff than, you know, office space. The two dumpsters that are at the building are very underutilized as it is. I don't anticipate with what, uh, with the food court service, what they would be doing would would require any additional dumpsters okay and currently there are they in the in one of the parking spots is that what that's is that where they are they're right over in the corner that shannon is circling right now yeah. oh. in this lower left corner and so when we reported that there was 101 parking spaces available that was with the deduction of these two spaces so there's 103 striped minus two being used for the dumpster gives 101 available on site Okay, got it. Thank you. Certainly. Madam yes. Chair, Mike Travolas, one more question before we... Uh, yes. Shannon, could you just talk about the 25% um, the waiver and if we were to move forward with that now and then revisit it, how does that work? Uh, so the exact wording is basically... Um, within a reasonable time frame, I believe it's a three to six month time frame of being requested by town staff and TPZ to implement the additional parking, the owner is obligated to do so. 
Okay. And if not, then at that point, they become in violation of their TPZ permit, cease and desist is issued, and fines and liens and murder, okay. which hopefully that is not required at any point in time. But that's that would be the mechanisms. Um, but the, the wording of the regulation is there's a limited time frame upon being notified by the town that these additional spaces must be uh, installed as shown on the plan. And really that's going to be driven by, you know, if we're seeing repeated issues uh, out on Talcott Forest Road, which um, is the main access into the residential development. So if there's Right, that's a, there's Talcott Glen, but there's also Talcott Forest coming in to all the residents in the box. So if uh, if there's an issue with parking out um, an overflow into Talcott Forest Road, we are gonna hear about it. And then that would be the triggering mechanism for requiring those spaces to be installed. For, for the applicant, is that something you're amenable to? I hope you're successful if this is approved and they you know, you, you would need the extra parking, but is that adding? Yes, it? we're aware. We we would we'd probably be doing the extra parking before um, before mm -hmm. the town would say anything. We obviously we we understand parking is is a vital component to, to the success of a building. So, okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, good questions. Anyone else? Shannon, can you check the chat for Liz? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there are no no more questions. No, okay. no more questions and no hands raised by anyone. So, okay. All right. So uh, at this point, um, let me close the public hearing portion of um, for this application, and uh, we need a motion and a second before discussion, please. Um, all right. So the motion are are we putting a um, are we putting in a condition with with the the review or what's the motion looking like? I think we should, and then it's we have a number of things in here, right? So Shannon, for um, I'm looking at the agenda review plus the the parking. Right, so the parking's an automatic because they're requesting the waiver, right? So the parking's okay. an automatic uh, with the request of the waiver for the 25% yep. requirement that they, it's part of the regulation, it's part of the request of the rate waiver. It's it's kind of that right and responsibility, right? They're making the request, understanding that if and when it's required in the future, they're obligated to play, uh, install that parking. And that's how it's worded in the regulation. So it really doesn't need to be an extra condition. Okay. It does require a five six vote. Um, so it's really um, it's the twenty four maximum capacity for dining in based on uh, what was represented by Mr. Reiner. You right. Um, whether or not you folks feel the parking should be restriped, um, the site plan is, uh, I guess, kind of here or there. It's fine as is. If he goes ahead and we do have to restripe, then a new plan would be needed. And the um, rooftop units to be screened, and then the hours of operation of six to eight p.m. If uh, if you folks want to dictate that. So, I mean, Patrick, I we're going to discuss it, right? So I may have to get okay, yeah, I, so. I would pro probably throw it all in, and then we can. I don't know. It's up to you. Whatever so, you so want. It, you can, we'll just amend it after you want to uh -huh. do it. You can. Absolutely, okay. we can. Yep. Yeah, Give it. Okay. Throw in what you want, and then it can be amended. Yes, yeah, so I'll just go generic, and then we'll amend. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, Patrick Carey, I'd like to make a motion to approve the application by Michael Rayner for special permit for food court use at 17 Telkett Notch Road in a BR zone. So, okay. So, we're leaving it. Okay. Sec you're expecting a second, right? I thought you were adding. That's fine. Who, who wants to second Patrick's motion? Scott also does second. Okay. Discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, so again, now this is where I figured we just discuss on what we want to put in for conditions. Sure. Instead of a one, the, the first one being too sloppy. Um, so. Yeah, so um, 
yeah, so what do we want to put in for conditions? I guess I'll just throw that out to you guys and go from there. So we talked about rooftop screening, right? Hours, six to eight daily. Are we okay with this? No. Oh. Well, uh, yeah, Liska has a six to eight a six a.m. to eight p.m. hours of operation. She chimed in on that. Are we all comfortable with those hours? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about uh, seating capacity? Do we want to put in the maximum twenty four? Can I, hey, and that's can I go back to the hours? Yes. What? The applicant only wants it to go to 8 p.m., right? So we're just kind of confirming that for the for the record here. I mean, 8 p.m. is doesn't seem that late. Like, why why not nine or why not ten? I mean, there's a lot of new mixed use apartments, and you know the hospital is sort of a 24/7 operation. I'm just curious. Again, just to, just to think about. <clears throat> that area of town and the development going on over there. Oops. Yep. No, you bring up a good point. Any, anyone? Uh, uh, if the applicant only wants eight, that's fine by me too. I, I got just something to, I don't know. We can always come back and ask for an extension. Okay. All right. That's fine. If, if, uh, listen, maybe it's a good problem to have if they come back and need more hours. So I'll, that works for me as well. The neighbors are happy, right? Because you do have, um, Definitely a dense residential area too. Um, but you're right, we hope it uh, takes off and it's a good problem to have. So are we all in agreement on six to eight? Daily yes. is okay, all right. Uh, capac seating capacity, do we wanna throw that in? How do we feel about it? So that comes back to parking. I think the keeping it at 24 makes sense. And if they need to adjust it later, again, they can come back and request that. Mike Grabulis, what do you think? Uh, I mean, can they put any more than 24? For, for not just the, from the space that they have, but for zoning regulations, or can they, if they want to abide by parking regulations? They'd have to update the parking requirement. So I think of the maximum at 24 uh, gets us where we need to be with the waiver that's been requested and understanding what can reasonably, uh, those spaces be reasonably accommodated on site based on the plan that we have before us. Works for me. Okay. Patrick, you good with that 24? Yeah, I'm good with 24, yep. Okay. Uh, any other conditions? Um, Patrick? Um, you're excited about this project? Yes. Are we? So are we doing the? Um, so we got that, and then are we still restriping the parking lot? That's one as well, correct? That's what we said. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so um, don't redo anything yet. So you're all set with questions. You are in agreement. Um, Mike, um, you're good with the project. You have any other things we should talk about? Or do you want to ask commissioners? No, I'm I'm good. You're good. Yep. Scott, how comfortable are you? I'm good at this point in this. Thanks. Okay. Matt, I'm how good are you with no, voting? I'm good to vote. Thank you. Okay. And how is our friend Liz? She <laughs> is good. good. All right. So uh, I don't have anything new that uh, we talked about. I do agree that, um, you know, when I first uh, read the application, I thought it was just for that office building, which I think is cool anyway, uh, but they, there really isn't that much in this area. Um, but it, it is tight a little bit, just the nature of the road and the condos and hopefully everybody behaves because there's nothing worse than, you know, going out to grab a bite to eat and you just can't park anywhere and just people won't come back, right? So it won't be a good story for the businesses. It will not be a good story for our town. Um, I like the conditions that we have. Um, so, Patrick, if uh, you're ready, you can if you can modify it, and Scott, you can second, please. Yes, I will. And I only have one other question. So, the updated sure. parking uh, plan does that have to like we have that on file, right? Or is that something that has to be 
like it says in the agenda review um, submitted. I think that can that can hold. We don't need that at this particular point in time. That's fine. If they uh, we'll we'll proceed with the plan that they've submitted on file, and then if they if we require additional parking, we'll require an updated plan at that point in time. Okay, so I think I got it. All right, I'd like Patrick Carrier. I'd like to amend um, my previous motion to include the following conditions: that the hours of operation are from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. at night, seven days a week, and that a maximum seating capacity of 24, or that there's going to be a maximum seating capacity of 24, and that the parking lot should be restriped to clarify, define the available parking spaces uh, before the food court is opened. And rooftop screening. And uh and rooftop screenings to be uh, to be yeah so you know what i'm sorry did those have to come back to us or is that uh if you're fine staff can it just it can be just staff satisfaction okay so yeah okay so rooftop screenings to satisfy town staff okay all right you made it all right scott you're good second yep just making sure he's done scott also a second <laughs> all right does everyone know what we're voting on Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. It's unanimous. The project is approved. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael and Brett. All right. We have one more. Sorry. And Thank you. Yep. You got it. And I'll, Shannon, you'll be in touch with the applicants. Of course. You yes. Do your thing. Okay. Great. All right, we have one other item in front of us for public hearing. It's um, an application for Mr. Wilson for property located at 61 Eli Road. It's application for special permit for clear cutting and restoration and ridgeline protection area and R80 zone. And who do we have? Uh, yeah, we have Mr. Wilson on the line. Yes, can you hear me? We yes. sure can. Yeah, this is Harold Mark Wilson with 61 Eli Road. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, first off, I wanted to explain that I think, and, and the town staff can correct me if I'm wrong, I have a very unique piece of property here that's unique on the mountain. It's a piece of property that a home was built on the ridge before the ridgeline ordinance was put in place. After the ridgeline ordinance was put in place, we bought the property, looked to build a new home, we weren't allowed to, believe it or not, keep or tear down the original home. Uh, there was no construction to be allowed on the ridge, which included, they told us at the time, tearing down the home. And we couldn't expand the home or modify the home because that would be construction on the ridge line. And Shannon, I'm going to ask you if you could possibly jump to page eight. Of course, I will, uh, yeah. Of my presentation. <clears throat> and I... Uh, I apologize, uh, maybe page nine, maybe one more. Certainly. Uh, for my kindergarten drawing, <laughs> the original home was actually built on the ridge. And if you could see where it says yard in the lower right-hand corner, that basically is the ridge line. Uh, that the uh, vertical lines you see next to the yards to the left, that's a deck where there was a pool. The garage, you can see, uh, obviously, where it says garage. And trying to work with the town to minimize the view of the new home that we built 75 feet behind this home, we agreed to take the top deck off of the house, uh, which would have been the master bedroom. We then, if you go to the lower drawing, we put in two concrete walls raise the yard 12 feet so that the line of sight from town farm road when it went over the what's called the deck here which was the top of the first floor of the original home the line of sight would go over the roof of our home if you go to page three which would probably be page four here now right there oh back one you can see this was the home in 2001 when we bought it. So if you could zoom in, if you could, on either one of those drawings or those pictures, 
uh, especially I think that one right there, Shannon, if you could drop, zoom in there, you can see obviously the roof line that we cut off. You can see the windows that were in the front, the flat part. If you look just to the left of that flat part, right above that tree, no, down, down, right there, that is actually the deck facade, about a 12 foot facade of cedar decking or cedar siding that protected the, uh, the infrastructure, if you will, of the deck and the pool. Um, everything behind that was uh, driveway. You can see from the snow on the ground that this was yard area. This was a place where they had their pool heater, they had their propane tanks and other um, you know, mechanical systems. And again, shown on the other picture to the right, just from a different view. Um, I don't know what you folks know, but this went before the Zoning Board of Appeals because I quote unquote was appealing a cease and desist order on cutting the trees. And I just wanna make it clear, I wasn't appealing a cease and desist order. We had already cut some trees and brushed down. Um, the town notified us that we were doing that in violation of the town ordinance and we'd already stopped doing it. Uh, we went before the Zoning Board of Appeals and presented basically the same presentation we're presenting here. Um, I've owned and developed three other lots on Avon Mountain or the mountain, uh, but those were in Avon. And we had done tree, uh, tree maintenance on those lots when we built those lots and developed homes. We've cut over 50 trees down on our property in the last five years uh, because of trees that are just dead or dying or trees that have already fallen. Um, our goal that we had was to cut down invasive plants that had started growing in front of the original home. And there, if you could maybe go to, and I apologize, you go to page seven or one more maybe, no, one more. This is the view out of the original home after we cut the top off from the main floor of the home. And as you can see, there's nothing growing in front of this view. What we've had in the last couple of years is we've had fast growing sumac and we've had fast growing weeds. And we went out there this September, late September, cut those weeds out, cut the sumac down. And if you go to my remediation plan, and I apologize for jumping around on you folks, um, which would probably be the second to the last page. If you look at the large white area, that's the existing house. That was the master bedroom floor. Just to the left of that, to the lower left, of that corner, no, the lower left, you see that dark shaded area. Those are four or five um, hardwood trees. No, nope, just right there where your hand is. Those are four or five hardwood trees and evergreens. Those trees, one of them was probably over 20 inches in diameter growing actually through the deck and had dropped so many limbs down it destroyed the deck. The evergreens had started dying off and were diseased over the period of the last four or five years. Those trees were cut down. If you move back down towards the new home, there's a number of trees in this area that were cut down. One was a tree that the town required us to keep. It was a large hardwood tree that was a, a, uh, a split fork tree, if you will that had already split in half and was being held together by wire. We were required to keep it by the town, but eventually it died and we cut it down. The tree closest to the home had to be cut down and two other trees in that area around where the hand was uh, in that area had been taken down because they died. If you go to the right hand side of the, up just a tad, right in that area, well, a little bit more to the left. We took two trees down there that also were dying and had dropped limbs onto the deck. The entire decking on this portion of the house has had to be replaced this year because of limbs that have fallen through and, and 
put holes in the uh, cedar decking that was there and required by our insurance company to replace the entire deck. Um, you can see from this view, which is a 2008 Google Earth, that there is, if you look right to the front or the top of that white area again, right where your hand was, there's one tree. If you just move a little bit to the northwest right there, there's one tree there. And you can see the shadows of other trees. It was not our intention to remove any trees that were viable trees or anything to um, create view. Uh, if you go to the picture before, about three pictures before this, one more maybe, you can see that the lower picture, and that happens to be one of my daughter's birthday parties, I believe it was around 2010 or 2011, you can see the three trees that are in this view. And if you look above it, you can see that there are three trees in the view, but obviously the largest tree uh, is no longer there because uh, that tree has been infestated and died and it was cut down. Um, we're not taking a position that we didn't violate an ordinance or regulation with the town because uh, I'm very familiar with the town ordinance on the tree line and the ridge line ordinance that before any construction can be done, we need to have permission for cutting trees. Quite frankly, I was ignorant to the fact that if there was a dead tree or we needed to maintain or, main, or contain our yard, that that needed to be done. So that is basically my position here today that we have not done anything other than take down dead trees. I've made a proposal to plant over 20 trees um, in the ridgeline area. Um, these are trees that would be one and a half to two inch in diameter. We have been working with an arborist. Shannon had asked us to provide something from the arborist on letterhead uh, last, I believe, Wednesday afternoon. I've been after them and reached out to them again today to provide that. They have not provided that to me. They've been out on site twice um, trying to do a tree count. They said was very difficult because they said it was difficult to determine what trees were cut when, what the species were, the number of uh, leaves on the ground, and it was the conditions were such that they just couldn't count trees. We've asked them to come out. Uh, Shannon mm -hmm. did provide us with a tree count um, from when we got the original approval to build this home back in 2002. And it showed the existing major trees within the ridgeline area. We've asked them to come out and do an assessment of the yard based on that. Um, and I, I, I guess that's really all I really have to say. Um, there's, you know, people are saying that We've cut down trees to improve our view. Uh, I think that when you look at some of the pictures that were taken in uh, September and October, the view looks worse than it actually is because the trees that were cut and the, the weeds and the fast growing invasive like sumac trees that were cut uh, were dying or dead. And so it left a lot of brown area on the ground when they were still green in the forest. I guess had I been smart, I'd have cut these trees down in January and maybe nobody would have known, but that wasn't our intention. Our intention was to try to maintain the yard, cut down trees that were damaging the home, cut down trees that were dead and, and diseased, just as we had done in the front of the house. Um, we had no intention of trying to violate anything or to you know, try to enhance a view because our view isn't it, is not enhanced because these trees were not taller than the view we have out of our home right now, except for the ones that I have pointed out to you that were diseased and dying. Um, so I'm open to any questions, any comments, anything anybody has to say. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. So what we have here is a special permit after the work was done, correct? Correct. Okay. 
Um, I did go back uh, and reviewed the um, the minutes uh, from November. And, uh, you know, a couple of things I guess I want to ask you first. Uh, this is Board of Appeals minutes. Um, you know, the one thing that stuck with me um, in the minutes, it says anything wrong. Uh, we have, uh, excuse me, Mr. Wilson agreed, but stated that it, he does not believe he had done anything wrong except didn't receive permission. I think that's the wrong here, not getting the appropriate permission, especially stating that you're familiar with the Ridgeline protection. But I guess I'll like so. No, and I I agree with what you're saying mm -hmm. that I do understand the Ridgeline protection ordinance because I've looked at it for building homes. I have a lot next door that we have for sale, and I know the ordinance for um, getting approval to build a home and the special permit that's required for building uh, or putting a structure on the on the Ridgeline or 75 or 100 foot off the Ridgeline. And quite frankly, I just wasn't aware that I needed to have permission from the town to cut down trees that needed to be cut down because they were dead or dying. Okay. okay. And I'll plead ignorant, even though ignorance is no excuse. Uh, yeah, I'm going to keep going. So in this November, uh, in the November minutes, uh, there is a, a reference to um, restoration plan. So I, I guess, why are you in front of us now? Is there a restoration plan in front of us or... Yes, this is, this is the plan that we have right here in front of you. The white circles indicate a mix of maples. The yellow circles represent Canadian hemlocks, uh, which talking with our arborists were trees that they had suggested that we plant. We're trying to, when you look at the red drawn line, I believe uh, the town had come out and measured uh, the area that they felt that the trees, uh, the most of the cutting had been performed in, were trying to fill that area uh, with trees and were willing to do so. Um, Shannon, is there an arborist that uh, filed anything with us or? No, as Mr. Wilson uh, indicated, we are still waiting for um, arborist report or statement of some type from the arborist. So. Yeah, it's, it's the same arborist that was at, is, is it 21, Eli, I believe, Shannon? Correct. Yep. Uh, so Marci Marcian and Foucher. I, I yes. don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct, but. Yeah, we have reached out to them last week when Shannon asked us to provide a written report mm -hmm. that they'd actually been on property. Uh, they did come out on property in, help me, Shannon, November, and then like late December. Um on November, they came December, out. December and January, based on our emails, yeah. and they had to come back in, in January once the because we they were fighting they, the rain at that point. But. Right, right. They came out in January and said it was very difficult to determine because if you look at the September 9th picture here that Shannon's showing, uh, all the brown uh, that looks like um, well, it's it's all dead leaves, dead trees laying on the ground and they had a difficult time going through that since then we've cleaned up the area where the hand is right now where your pointer is we've cleaned up most of the debris there um so it's easier for them to come out and look at the trees that were cut and count the trees um i think garrett had indicated that he had counted over uh, 14 plus trees that were 10 inches in diameter um and we're agreeing with that. That's why we're going with a count of 20 trees. Um, most of what is cut there that you're looking at, though, is sumac and other what I'll call invasive species that in the last two years or three years have grown, um, but never exceeded the height of, of any, any of our pro, any of the structures. Uh, and we went and just cleared it back down to the grass that was originally um the the front yard or the backyard of this home that was the original backyard that was all grass when we purchased this property so obviously you know we cannot undo what has been done but what is the timing for the restoration well my understanding is we could plant in september october or probably april may so it would be this this spring we would be planting all right, I will, um, I have more questions, but let's, I, I feel like we don't have a complete complete plan right now, Shannon. I don't know why I feel that way, but I do. 
let's turn it over to uh, the rest of the commissioners to see what questions they may have. Uh, Patrick. Um, I just, well, I had seen, um, so what were those pictures? I had gone through the pictures. Were those pictures that Shannon, you and, uh, or Garrett or your town staff took? So of these, so correct. So there was a couple of different um, slides presented. So there was th this presentation that uh, Mr. Wilson just went through that has his documentation and the um, and the outline. So this outline that he has shown is taken uh, and matches the outline that's on the next set of slides that town staff had put together. Uh, we had done this as part of the ZBA presentation in November. So uh, we have um, access to aerials taken every six months. And so this is um, representation of the area that we, you know, Garrett was out on site. It's a representation of the area that we believe had work conducted on it. And so the polygons match and um, that polygon is reflected then uh, virtually identically on Mr. Wilson's plan that was shown on the last page. And then, uh, yes, these are photos that were provided um, and Mr. Wilson was provided these as well in advance, but these were in the uh, SharePoint file that was sent to the commission. So these are the, um, the trees that Garrett was able to access when he was there uh, in September. Um, and so that was the in that in that last photo give well if you go back about three or four more that those photos give you an idea of the one more this this way no, no the other way i'm sorry that's okay this way that, that that gives you an idea of the brush and the the sumac and the the weeds and stuff that we cut down when Garrett came out and, and took these pictures, we had stopped cutting trees maybe four days, five days prior to this. So this isn't something that was laying there for four or five weeks and dying in the sun. This is stuff that was already dead and dying when we cut it down. Uh, if you go, I think one other picture, uh, there's one that shows the front of right there that's the facade for the deck um for the house and so that would be the pool way up on top of that would be the pool and then you would have two-story of house above that and and the trees so nobody has confirmed what type of tree they were um that were out there like no, they have not yet. And is that something that's being done, or is, is yeah, we've we've requested it. And we put another request today, and we're willing to. I mean, like I said to Shannon earlier today, I'm not going anywhere. The trees aren't going anywhere. Um, we're not going to be planting trees for the next month or two, and I'm going to get the arborist out here. And if I can't get that same firm out here, we'll get another firm out here to confirm what trees were cut. Uh, the conditions of the trees, the age of the trees, um, and the type of trees that they were. And clearly, some there of were some that... there were some very large trees that were cut down, clearly but these so. trees have been dying for years, and we finally cut them down. Yep. And clearly, Again, some are, are diseased, or we're seeing that the stumps the stumps are deteriorating or split. So there is certainly evidence of. Uh, some of these being distressed, but yeah, unfortunately, um, we have not received an arborist report. And again, because of the topography, I don't, I don't know that we'll, I don't know that we will get the clarity that we would like on the type of trees based on the stumps that are, uh, you know, the stumps that were evident. But that's the request that's been put forth at the time at this moment. Okay, thank you. No more questions. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Mike? I uh, appreciate the background on it, but, um, you know, without a site observation or a recommendation from an arborist, there's no action we can take, correct? Correct. And we, I, we've, Shannon and I talked about that this afternoon, that we should probably 
continue this public hearing until we do get the arborist report, which I hopefully will get the next week or two. Okay. Thank you. No questions. Thanks, Mike. Scott? No, I was thinking exactly along the lines of Mike. It, I think it's we're just waiting for that arborist report. So the uh, info was helpful, but that'll be really important, obviously. Okay. Matt? Yeah, so so just so I'm clear, Mr. Wilson, and I appreciate your info, are you looking for us to sort of retroactively approve the, the tree cu cutting that has already been done and you're sort of proposing to replace those or replant those with sort of up to 20 trees? Oh, I'd love you to say, God bless you, don't do anything, but I know you're not going to do that. <laughs> I, I would expect you to wait for an arborist report to come in to indicate what was done, what trees were cut, what trees, what the conditions of the trees were with his report on remediation plan and you then to act upon that is what I would expect you to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shannon, this one's for you, really the town staff, so I'm curious. Does the town ordinance speak to us looking at disease trees differently from this healthy trees is is there a way for the town you know or for homeowners to cut down diseased trees or is a tree a tree regardless of however it's in the problem? in the ridge line we we take the same view with the uh, ridge line as we would a wetland or a conservation easement in that if a tree needs to come down, if it's diseased or dying, that they are, the homeowner is obligated to notify us. Obviously, if it's an imminent danger and we can't get out there immediately, then they um, certainly are within the right to go ahead and remove it. And then staff will go out and, and, uh, and take a look. Um, but typically, I mean, upon notification, staff can be out within a, uh, typically within a day, sometimes two, uh, particularly if it's an urgent matter. Um, and we go out and take a look and confirm that the tree is, in fact, a dying disease. Generally, it's quite evident. Sometimes it's difficult in this time of year when the trees are dormant. Um, a lot of times what we like to do is do a... Uh, a walk through in the summer or fall, understanding that perhaps the homeowner doesn't want to take the trees down until the winter because it's a lot easier to take them down when the, the leaves are off or the adjoining trees leaves are off. Um, but uh, in our ridgeline protection zone, permitted uses, emergency work necessary to protect life or property. Emergency work shall include but not be limited to the removal or trimming of dead or dangerous trees. Prior to the commencement of such activity, a plan for conducting all emergency work shall be submitted to and approved by the planning department. So that's what's written verbatim. So even under, again, unless something is eminent, we're typically Bruce Garrett or I can be out the same day if it's truly that urgent. Um, but we also can rely, we've got a tree warden that um, so there are other staff members that we can rely on if needed, but that's the wording in the regulation. Yep, no, got it. And thank you for reminding me about the tree warden. Um, no, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Matt and Liz. Shannon, if you can pop over. Uh, thanks for the information. We need to wait to get the arborist report. Is what Liz has typed into our chat feature. Um. Okay, so no other questions. Um, do we, um, what happens with the cease and desist? Do we do anything with that or is that's not our preview? No, that's uh, town staff will handle the cease and desist. Okay. Yeah, that's our zoning enforcement uh, end of that. So that's it. it what happens is that it, that's the driving force to get this um, in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, town staff, what happens is once there's an approved plan, then town staff does a uh, limited lift of the cease and desist in order to um, implement the plan that's approved by the commission. Um, and then there's other inspection measures that are taken. Um, and, and if needed, we'll, we'll look at other measures if, if that's needed. Okay. All right, good. Yes, yeah, so we um, clearly uh, need to continue, right, uh, with what's going on. I just, uh, you know, um, 
it's done. We cannot undo it. But ignoring the law is not an excuse. Uh, you know, I was just thinking about, um, you know, speed limit. You have a license in this country. You, you go to a different state. It, you're going to uh, drive whatever you want to drive because you're in a different state and you don't know. It doesn't work like that. And, um, you know, I think there have to be consequences when you violate laws. And um, the minutes are pretty clear from when this was presented. Uh, I'm sorry, we're still waiting. It's February. So do you think we'll get anything from the Arborist this month or? or who oh, I'm hoping uh, to talk to them tomorrow, the next day and get them out here within the next week and do the tree count. Okay. Yeah, right. Because it said, I think, 10 days in, in November. So uh, so we'll be seeing you at the next meeting, possibly. And I believe that next meeting is, is it March 13th? No, sir. The next, so the next meeting is uh, in two weeks. TBZ okay, two, weeks. two weeks. So February 27th is the next meeting. Good. Okay. Because okay. the 13th. Ideally, we'll there. take care of it then. Uh, the March 13th meeting is uh, a full agenda, and I don't know that it would be able to be accommodated. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to proceed with the Right. Majority I, of the presentation this evening because the agendas are getting quite full for TPZ. Um, I didn't want to push this in its entirety to the 27th. So I figured it at least allows for the bulk of the conversation this evening. And then hopefully a, um, a quick and informative review of the Arborist report at the next meeting so that uh, the commission can address this matter and we can all move forward. Uh, I will let, let you know tomorrow if I hear from them. Shannon, uh, since you know this was published, right? The mm -hmm. notice is there Absolutely. anyone online that has questions? So, uh, just for the record, we have not received any written correspondence regarding uh, this matter re regarding the hearing and the notification of this hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a few individuals that have called in. I don't know if anyone for this particular um, item. So. With that, if you have called in to offer comment on this public hearing, please raise your hand using the feature in Zoom and you'll be addressed to uh, address comments or acknowledge to address comments to the commission. Again, if anyone has called in to offer comment on this application, please raise your hand using the feature in Zoom uh, so we can acknowledge you so you may address your comments to the commission. All right, Madam Chair, there are no hands raised at this particular point. All right, thank you. So uh, we need a motion, please, uh, and a second to continue to March, excuse me, February 27th, please. Oh uh, yeah, Patrick Carey, I'd like to make a motion to continue the public hearing for the application for special permit presented by Mark Wilson um, for clear cutting and restoration in a ridgeline protection area for property located at 61 Eli Road in an R80 zone. Got Hall said I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions, okay. Uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next meeting, Mr. Wilson. Yes, you will. Thank you very much, folks. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you for having the agenda. <laughs> All right, so we're done with public hearing. Oh, planner's report. Planners report. Oh, we've got all sorts of fun things. Okay. So uh, first up is land use training this Thursday. Uh, it's the Yukon Clear online training. And it is from 4 to 5.30 this Thursday. And of the three that have been available in this series, this one's perhaps um, the most important. It is uh, regarding fair and affordable housing. So maybe this February 16th, this Thursday from four to 5.30. I understand it's a challenge for some of you. Uh, they are recording it. As soon as I get the link to those recordings, I will uh, make them available uh, to you. I made the first one I missed last week's because I had a developer meeting that went right through till 5.30 last Thursday. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, this Thursday I'll be able to log on and uh, listen in to this one in person. And um, and again, we'll make that available to you as soon as UConn Clear has posted those online. 
question I, I, before you go i i think um they they are running past like the 5 30 just for the record the last two anyway yeah. um with the q a it's it's more like six o'clock but yeah ho hopefully you'll still join us uh, but they've been good super informative and uh, i feel like we're doing the right thing we're, yeah we're getting we're certainly getting there it's nice it's nice it's a it's an interesting mix on that conversation that's for sure so mm -hmm. this one should be interesting because i have not heard an attorney so in, in this type of format speak yet regarding yeah. uh the fair and affordable housing so it'll be interesting to see which direction this conversation goes this thursday i agree thank you um okay upcoming applications um next uh, next meeting one benefit for me taking this from my office today so the next meeting we have um 368 plainville avenue so that is the gas station redevelopment at the intersection of route 177 and burlington avenue Mm -hmm. If there's, um, th it has proceeded through Inland Wetlands and it um, they're responding to comments. I do not have updated plans yet. When I get them, um, uh, there are folks that would like hard copies of the three, um, 368 Plainville Avenue gas station renovation. I, I would like, I would like a copy, please. Okay. Anyone else? I know Matt Hup Wagner, you normally do. Do you want one? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Grabulis. Sure. Thank okay. you. Jay. Anyone else have a yeah, I would take one as well. PC. Okay. Like Liz, yeah. Liz, yes. Might as well just do the whole group. Scott, round it out. All right. That's <laughs> fine. I'll get them. I'll Glad get them. you asked, huh? <laughs> nope, that's fine. I just, um, we'll do everyone, um, and I'll include the alternates. So, um, that's fine. Absolutely. And that's why I asked the question. I know some of these, it's much easier. Um, the other application is a blasting. At, so it's a special permit for blasting, um, for Dominique's court off of, uh, copper mine. I don't, there's not really any full size plans that go with that. Uh, it's just a plan set that uh, we've already looked at when they came through for the subdivision. So okay. I'm going to do hard copies for that. So those are the two public hearings for the next um, meeting on the 27th. And then coming up on the 13th is the Morea Road project. I already have hard copies in. So I have the hard copy of the site plan. Um, oh, the subdivision plan, the drainage report, and the traffic report. So those are ready for pickup or distribution. Um, again, that's out a month from today. So there's a little more time, but there's a little more stuff to review um, with that as well. Yep. So folks are ready to come in and pick those up at any point in time. You're welcome to come in. Um, if you need me to drop them off, let me know and we can make arrangements. I'll probably do an email. Um, I'll also follow up with the applicant for 368 Plainville to confirm when I'll have hard copies of everything. I know it's a lot easier if we do this in at one shot. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to jam everybody up either um, trying to get these reviewed. So, um, but that's where that stands. I'll do a follow up email once I know when I'll have the hard copies for Plainville Avenue and then um, just keep me posted if uh, if you can come in and pick them up. That's great and appreciated. If you need them dropped off, then we're happy to accommodate that as well. So um, I think that's it from a planner's report standpoint, unless anybody has a um, random question or has a follow-up for me. And if, if not, then I was going to move into our okay. work session and touch on some of our uh, residential review items. Um, Shannon, Shannon, I have a question for you. Uh, so there's some, some work happening at the McCollum factory. Do you know what yes. that is? Uh, there's some earthwork going on. Yeah. Um, my understanding is there's uh, just some, some tree clearing and prep work, uh, trying to get a staging area established um, with the hope that they will be able to start doing some of the excavation for the trail realignment. That's my loose understanding. 
Um, beyond that, I'm not, uh, I don't have exact details of that, uh, uh -huh. but that's my understanding is they're just, they're just doing some, some clearing. They're outside the wetland area. Uh, Bruce has been on site a couple of times just to check to make sure we don't have, um, erosion control issues or the need for erosion control in place. And that's all been, uh, reviewed. Is it still with DOT? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I feel like on Zoom, I think there's a delay. So I am always like interrupting. Mm -hmm. But uh, commissioners, do you have any other uh, questions before we move into the works session? All right. Silence. Okay. Silence. All right. <laughs> All right. So I've got a few things to update um, everyone with. Uh, some of it's follow up, some of it's answering questions. Um, I know at the end of the last meeting, there was a lot of, there's kind of a lot of general questions and a thought of focusing on inclusionary zone for the coming into this meeting and through this meeting. Um, I do want to touch base on the newsletter. I know one of the things was a comment about making sure that uh, the public was aware that these work sessions are taking place and the best way for offering comment. So a thank you to Inez because she went right home that night and did a, uh, a draft that uh, got us started. And this is what should appear in our winter newsletters up on the screen right now. Um, it was shared with the town manager and our director of public works. The town manager wanted a statement up front about the moratorium. Um, and with that, I wanted to make sure it was clear it's not a moratorium on building permits because folks that don't do this every day don't necessarily understand that. Um, we made note that the conversations are taking place regularly on the agenda and that uh, uh, the general public's welcome to listen in and hear about the conversations and the direction the commission's going and to have anybody that is interested or has questions to contact either Garrett or I directly for additional information or to offer comment or discussion. And then again, depending, sometimes it's just general inquiries, uh, but if there are things um, or concerns, we'll make sure that that gets relayed to the commission directly. Um, and that would be uh, just part of the general correspondence that comes to you folks. So uh, that should, uh, I believe the newsletter will be hitting the streets here in a week or so. Um, and that should be included in the newsletter. So that should hit everybody's mailbox. Thank you for uh, being brave and uh, putting your names out there. <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll see. It'll be interesting to see what direction, direction yeah. that goes. Um, Upcoming guest speakers, we have Desegregate Connecticut will be here for the February 27th meeting at 6.30. Um, I heard them speak on Friday, um, which I'll touch on uh, in a minute. And it was interesting to get their perspective on, uh, on affordability and affordable housing in general. Then um, on March 27th, Nancy Parent, our Director of Community Services, will be in to discuss the roles and responsibilities of our housing authority in Farmington. Uh, this is going to be particularly important for TPZ to understand um, and for us to decide as part of our decision-making process um, if the TPZ chooses to look at uh, inclusionary zoning and a fee and lieu program as part of this whole zoning umbrella uh, and changes. If we're looking at trying to implement that, then that fee and lieu, the funding for fee and lieu would go to uh, the housing authority. So getting a better understanding of what they're looking at and even just some of the day-to-day -day that uh, Nancy is working with, I think is um, an important perspective. So that will come on uh, March 27th I, at 6.30. I've left the 13th open um, just with the understanding that I think we're gonna have a heavy night uh, from a permitting standpoint that evening. Um, uh, last Friday, 
I listened in to uh, Center for Housing Opportunity webinar. I had forwarded that on to all of you. Uh, it was 9 to 10.30 in the morning. That should be made available um, online here. Um, again, and I'll share that as that becomes available. But it was interesting. There are six groups, um, nonprofit groups, and various interest points, all related to affordability, homelessness, housing, equity, all taking a slightly different look at it and a different uh, through a different lens all with the same intent and all have legislation that they have or are supporting in this legislation, uh, leg legislative session. So there's T uh, CT Coalition to End Homelessness, CT Fair Housing, um, Desegregate Connecticut, Growing Together CT, Open Communities Alliance, and Partnership for a Strong Community. Um, and I can forward this to you as part of this, they were, uh, there's a Google Doc link that they included in their presentation that you could sign up for that would um, uh, maintain, uh, you can maintain updates on the legislative <laughs> session. Prague also plans on uh, doing this and trying to keep us up to date on how these bills are advancing through. So that might be an easier way to do that uh, in the long run. Um, so if I get any additional information from CROG, then I'll be happy to pass that along. Um, but so that was um, Friday for an hour and a half Friday morning. And again, it, it might be interesting. It's one of those you can kind of play in the background as you're doing something else, but listen to key points of, uh, of the conversation. And it's kind of interesting to hear just some of the statistics about some of the fair rent and the rent practices that are going on that, of course, I wouldn't even be aware of being a homeowner, um, but some of the interesting things that were discussed and uh, I think drives more to the need end of, of things for why we're trying to take a look and see if there's some improvements that can be made with our regulations. Um, today, there was a meeting at 10 o'clock this morning. I was not able to attend. Prague and Sustainable CT. Let's see if I can grab the right link here. This is the housing agenda. That's our plan. That's inclusionary zoning, man. I don't think I got it. I don't think I put a link over here for that. Prague and Sustainable CT are partnering in creating an affordable housing pilot. And they are using funding from Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. And they had a webinar this morning with other Prague communities. So Avon, Plainville, uh, Bristol. Canton, uh, Simsbury, uh, Enfield was on. Uh, there was somebody from Tallinn. It goes as far over as Tallinn, uh, the greater Hartford area. Um, and so planners were on. And what we had was a presentation from Sustainable CT and CROG. What they're looking to do is help communities implement their affordable housing plan. It's a nine-month commitment for this pilot. Um, ideally, they are looking for um, a group from each community to participate, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it would be, if we choose to proceed, it would be Garrett and myself. I would reach out to Nancy Parent to see if there's somebody from her office that's willing to participate or is able to participate. Um, and ideally, there would be a commission member that would like to participate to some extent. And it's um, going through and doing uh, some fact finding. Let's see if this is it. So this is the yeah. So this is it. This is the link. So this is the statement um, of interest. And 
what they're going to do is it's a commitment to attend and participate in three listening and engagement sessions in March, April, and May. Certainly understanding that whomever from TPZ, if there is an interested member, um, again, understanding work commitments, and it's not always possible to do these things during the day, but at least be engaged in the conversations to the extent practical. Um, but there'd be uh, meetings initially facilitated by Sustainable CT and CROG. During the process, we'll engage with Greater Hartford residents experiencing challenges with affordable housing and uh, listen, uh, basically listening um, and trying to get additional information. Um, there'd be access to Sustainable CT's uh, database with respect to implementation. Um, and then we'd be required to just share experiences, which certainly town staff um, could be part of. So I haven't committed one way or the other to this uh, yet. I've got a few more questions for the folks at CROG um, with respect to our commitment, right? With every, with every right comes a responsibility. I wanna make sure that, um, you know, that we can adhere to the responsibility end of this and make sure that um, it's truly a fact-finding uh, element with the intent that it's a guide to assist in implementing the portions that Farmington is comfortable implementing and not, um, not necessarily being directed to implement something that perhaps doesn't fit as well as we'd like it to. So I just want to make sure that we're clear um, on that. So I'm I'm doing a little bit more back and forth with Craig on that, but I'll share. All of this will get uploaded to the SharePoint site, um, and then for further conversation the next week or and two weeks, excuse me. Shannon, if uh, there is a uh, interest from the commissioner, they should contact you. Yes. Yeah. If somebody is interested, um, even if. Do you think your your time availability is somewhat limited, but um, would be interested um, in serving on that? Then yes, absolutely, email me, okay. and we'll uh, we'll make sure your name gets added in. Then um, we did get a question, and I apologize. There's a, a commission member emailed last week with questions that I, oh, Garrett and I were muscling through and um, juggling a couple things. I wasn't able to get all the uh, info pulled together in order to email out in advance of the meeting. But I think the questions are important enough. I'd like to go through them. And then uh, along with staff response, this will also get uploaded. And um, this is easy enough. I could just email this out. It's just a PDF. Um, but there were some questions that came in about, again, understanding where we are with our affordability and that, um, what the future development impact may or may may not be. So the question um, was, we're at the 7.9% uh, affordable housing in Farmington when the affordable housing plan was approved back in July of 2021. And how are we in being impacted with the new housing units that have been approved? Mm -hmm. So there's a summary that Garrett had put together um, and it talks about that the, the number that we get, the 7.93 comes from uh, DECD, the Department of Economic and Community Development um, and the Affordable House, Housing Appeals list that they issue. That unfortunately has not been updated yet for, it gets updated in 2023 with the 2022 numbers um, and we'll, it, it could be out any time now. It could be um, it, it could be as late as April when we see that. Um, but what what is important is this seven point nine three uh, is based on the twenty ten census numbers. So even though we've got twenty twenty census data that hasn't been incorporated yet into the calculations that are going on. So what I did was I then ran through the math and God bless him, Bruce took a look at this at the end of the day before, uh, before this was finalized. So this, this first block runs through exactly what's in the affordable housing plan. So this is the 11,000, we'll call it 11,100 units 
of housing in Farmington of those 11,881 are affordable. And that's based on the definition uh, um, as shown in the affordable housing plan. And it's discussed a little bit. Uh, it's in question B, response to question three. You'll see how that 881 breaks out. Um, so that gives us that it's just straight division, right? 881 over the 11,100 gets us a 7.93. 8-30G gives us a 10% goal, right? It's a goal, it's just set up in the Connecticut General Statutes. It's a 10% goal. So that's just 10% of our total housing units. Again, that's hopefully just straightforward math. Mm -hmm. And then the units we still uh, need to reach is just subtraction, right? So if this is our 10% at 11, uh, 1110, and the total affordable is at 881, then we've got 200 and we'll call it 230 units that are needed at the time that that affordable housing plan went into um, being right we needed 230. Yeah. so then i took that and went to the 2020 census numbers because we do have the 2020 census but it just the total housing units mm -hmm. we don't have the update um on the affordable yet because that comes from as i noted above comes from decd so from 2020 census, there's an additional about 560 units uh, that are added in. It brings us to 11,667. I left the affordable at 881. Um, there hasn't been any new deed restricted ones. And the rest of them are uh, CHIFA mortgages, government assisted uh, government vouchers. And there's, according to my discussions with Nancy and my understanding, there's been very little fluctuation um, in those over the last couple of years. So this may have changed a little bit, probably not as much as the total housing unit has. So this is back to just the same math, right? The division to correct, uh, calculate the percentage. The goal is simply 10% of the total housing unit. And then the Delta is the, that 10% to the 881. So there's a uh, an increase there over the 230 from the previous calculation. You can see that. Um, so that increase, the percent increase, just just for the increase in housing units, is an increase in 24 percent, or an additional 56 units of affordable housing that would be needed to hit the 10 percent. All right, bear with me. For anyone that doesn't love math, I apologize. For those that do, you're probably no, no, it's okay. Okay. Can I ask you a quick, sure. Ask you a quick question. Yeah, you absolutely. Up. Jump in anytime if there's a question. Uh, no, this is the, um, so housing vouchers. I'm yep. curious. So maybe this is an Nancy Parent question, but if someone receives a housing voucher and they use it on a market rate apartment, right? To, does that unit then become affordable and not market rate anymore? Uh, it's calculated differently, is my understanding. I can confirm with Nancy, but if they're using the housing voucher to offset the rent right. on a market rate apartment, then that housing voucher is credited and it's being in that apartment is being rented in Farmington, then that, that voucher is calculated towards Farmington's affordability number. Mm -hmm. Got it. So it counts as part of you one of the know. units in the affordable column. Correct. You know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If it's being, it, yeah. And I, I'll be honest, I do not know all the ins and outs of housing vouchers, how they're used. Uh -huh. oh, no. um, yeah. So, but that's, uh, I can, I can ask Nancy and get a little more info, but yes, housing vouchers are included. The utilization of housing vouchers are included in the uh, 881. Okay. I think that's an important, important point. So thank well, you. But there are also different types of vouchers, right? There's a state and then there's some town. Um, so you may have like rent that's $1,000 is the market rent, but someone may have a voucher for up to 850, depending how many occupants, mm -hmm. and they will make up the $150 difference out of pocket. Right. And then that unit becomes quote unquote affordable, not quote unquote market rate. Not always I, that's a good nancy question i don't I yeah don't i don't know that it changes how that market how they right. how they 
it doesn't necessarily change that unit from affordable to market, right. but it's that that individual, that household is is um, the, we the community is it, it's counted as an affordable um, unit with respect to the household because of the utilization of the voucher. Right, but it's only for that one year, Matt. They have to. Most of the time, what happens, they have to vacate, actually. It's it's ugly. But I don't think it's, cons it's no. not, it's a regular rent, you know? And the, the payment uh, is a voucher or a combination of voucher and something else. But it's not designated as affordable housing. But they're paying that way, right? Using assistance. Um, I know some- Well, I think that's an important thing to clarify because the math is going to be tough for 10%, yeah. right? For a variety yeah. of reasons. But if there was, if out, right, the voucher, using the voucher on a market rate unit to help make it affordable for an individual, and then that unit becomes affordable and it helps with the percentage. Yeah, I don't think it does, I, though. I don't yeah, think it, it doesn't actually change the rent for the, <clears throat> um, it doesn't make it an affordable unit. Right. It's a government assistance to the family. So if that family then chooses to move to Berlin, yeah, right, then yeah. that voucher goes with them to Berlin right. and that right. housing unit comes back on as market rate or, or is it is rented as a market rate. Yeah. And we and say we don't have somebody else that comes in with a voucher to mm -hmm. uh, backfill. Right. So then that voucher went to Berlin and is no longer with Farmington. And it's now we're at 880 instead of 881. Yeah, I think you're I think you're saying the same thing as me. Like it's if that individual who has the voucher lives in an, a unit, the it goes plus one in the affordable column. Yeah. And then if that individual moves, it goes minus one. In yes. The There's no that is my know. understanding. Yes. I, I don't know. Well, we'll see. We'll see. And then some vouchers are only for the um, security deposits. They're not for the entire thing. So like, where does that fall? So it will be, Nancy's conversation will be very good. Um, uh, what we can do too is when the DECD report comes out for 2022, we can, uh, Garrett's on, uh, Garrett's, yeah, Garrett's still online. Garrett can drill in and see if we can start <laughs> to get some answers to uh, these questions to see um exactly when when we get these breakdowns of okay you're 881 and we've got so much is deed restricted so much is chief of usda mortgage so much is tenant rental assistant and then so much is government assistant what is that by definition for those four categories and how how fluid are they um mm. And that I don't, I mean, obviously the deed restricted, that's in, in one category, chief of mortgage presumably is in a more, you know, again, a more solid category. Um, but the tenant rental and the government assisted, I don't know how fluid those are um, and how transient it may be. I don't know how much that fluctuates on a year to year basis. So we can take a look at that and also um, check in with Nancy and see if we can get an answer. Great, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, Back to the numbers. Back to math. Back to math. Oh, okay. Wow. So I went back. So just for, so this is the benchmark, right? For the 2020 affordable housing plan, 7.93%. I'm jumping then for this first block down to this third block. And we had um, 1,026 units of multifamily market rate housing that came on the books. Or, or were approved, sorry, they have not all been built. A portion of them now are on the books with um, the up house, right? The, the redevelopment of the Marriott. Mm -hmm. Multi-family, 62 units. This is 80 South Road, um, the Sager development. Single family, 72 units. Um, and these were uh, what was reported, Garrett had pulled these uh, and there was a table in the moratorium when we did the uh, presentation for the moratorium. So we're going to sum the housing units, right? So we'll go back to the 11106 units from the 2010 census, the market rate units, the affordable units, single family units, and we get a total. 
Um, and then some affordable is the affordable from above plus the 62 right from Sager's right because this is it's mm -hmm. the 10% of our total units so that 62 gets added into the sum of our total housing units but then it gets counted again because it's affordable yeah and so it's the percentage of our total units drops to 7.69% our 10% goal is the same math it's 10% of our total units this line up up here um and then total units needed to reach 10 percent has now jumped from 229 to 283 mm -hmm. right and that's all i've done increase over 2020 is the 283 to 229 is a 23 and a half percent or 54 units i went and also then did, okay, what if, because Mr. Sager has been clear for the his 62 units, you need the chief of funding. If we proceeded without 80 South Road, if we didn't get it at 80 South, that, that comes out of then our total units and our affordable mm -hmm. um, line item. So that 62 comes out in both places and it hurts um, even more, right? Uh, so then we have, uh, 390, uh, 339 unit Delta, um, and a 47% increase over this number. So it'd be 340 units total. We would need to reach our 10%, um, which is a hundred units over where we had been. Yeah. And you can say that about any of these, right? I mean, none of these, none of these other market rates are on board yet either, um, but I just, I wanted to take a look because his is particularly with the, uh, tied to the chief of funding. And then basically I just did the same thing all over again, but I used this 2020 census number and dropped this down. So I did the same. I used the 2020 census number, added in the new housing development, did the new affordable housing number and ran the same math. So, and it just, it keeps going up. Right, so it's, it was 339 here to get to 10%, and it jumps to three, uh, 395 units here to get to 10%. Um, and I think what might be even more important than understanding what we need to get to 10% is the need that is already in the Farmington community, which was outlined in the affordable housing plan, and it's page nine of the affordable housing plan. Um, and again, this is based on the statistics at the time the plan was written. Uh, there are 2,950 uh, 2, households or 28% of our households that make less than 80% than of the median area median family income. And then there's a breakdown and these were in the charts in the plan of a thousand, just over a thousand households are low income at 50 to 80 percent. There's 900 households are very low income at 30 to 50. And surprisingly, we have, or, or perhaps not, uh, 980 households considered extremely low income, which would be less than 30 percent. Wow. So yeah. while this 10 percent is, um, is not, it, it's the benchmark that's in the general statute. And what all that benchmark means is once we hit 10%, we are no longer susceptible to um, an, an ad, or what I would term an adverse 8-30 uh, application, meaning someone um, perhaps coming in and not really wanting to adhere to any sort of um, consideration that the commission may want to make with respect to setbacks, aesthetics, landscaping, uh, parking, uh, et cetera. Um, I mean, really uh, the, the application that came through with uh, for 80 South Road, for the most part, looked like almost any other application that the commission considers. Um, at the end of the day, it was 8-30G and um, uh, but they took the time to modify the regulation to address staff comments and modify plans to address staff comments. There are some things they need to adhere to, uh, wetlands and stormwater management, obviously stormwater management because of 
safety and flooding concerns, wetlands, um, they're not, uh, they can't um, ignore, but it does, um, they do have a lot more latitude. Um, and that's all that benchmark does for us is that a developer coming in wanting to bypass all the regulations would not be able to do so as easily um, mm -hmm. as they could if we're still below the 10%. But clearly our um, our need for our outreach is simply 10%. Um, moving on to the second question that was emailed in, has there been an analysis done on available land in Farmington for potential future residential housing? A search on GIS seems to show very little other than a parcel located, uh, I believe this is a parcel located at the intersection of of Route 6 and 177 over by Tungsis. Um, everything seems to be hindered by either wetlands or topography or open space. Um, but we did, yeah, the, the question acknowledged obviously the conversion of the Marriott. So um, I think with this, the, the question inherently is acknowledging that it's, it's difficult because we, we can start to look at a, a variety of, of things. So. Clearly, Marriott, Batterson Park Road, 402, Farmington Avenue were all implemented with the floating zone. Um, and that special innovation floating zone was done uh, too with a, a distinct thought in mind with supporting our uh, the technology, that driving technology field and innovative field, both within the Yukon Health Center and the incubator spaces there, as well as that um, I-84 corridor and um, having some of the, you know, Pratt & Whitney and a uh, variety of uh, technology, uh, the Raytheon buildings, et cetera, in that corridor. Um, Marriott was um, potential to redevelop and underutilized space. Um, we also have the Midpoint Development District and that has, um, was also an opportunity to portion redevelop some some space and um, create new housing, and that was all done, um, you know, under that umbrella with the, the current zoning that's in place. Um, let's see. Look, Farmington is currently has an office vacancy rate of ten percent. However, this doesn't reflect the potential for leases not to be renewed in coming years. It's presumed any conversion of an office space to residential would um, include an entire building. And some of this 10% is just small spaces within existing buildings. So right now we're not seeing a huge, you know, any, any large chunks, um, but there is the potential for those to be converted to housing. And I think with some of these conversions that we've seen, um, you know, it's, it's in there, do we need to put some of that affordable housing parameter, whether it's in these special zones or within um, or an overall umbrella uh, to include affordable um, and a fee in lieu. Um, less, some less obvious uh, properties um, would include the 80 South Road that were three properties in two zones that were merged together to create the um, affordable housing development, 80 South Road. The midpoint development was a consolidation of four properties and two owners or an owner and develop interested developer working together. Um, there are other properties in the Yukon Health Center and midpoint development district that can support housing and can support a assemblage of properties. Um, and, and there are other, I had it at one point in the mall with the vacancies at the mall, um, people interested in uh, the Lord and Taylor space, which obviously is not gonna go in that direction now, but at one point there was conversation of should Lord and Taylor be apartments? And there are other municipalities um, throughout the United States that are doing that. And their, their shopping centers, one of the anchors is a, um, is housing. It's starting to become a, a mixed use development unto itself. 
So uh, third question was, do we know how many of the 881 protected units are subsidized in some way? How many have temporary deed restrictions and when are they expiring? So here's our breakdown of 881. This matches directly to the chart in the affordable housing plan, which is on page four of the affordable housing plan. And this is what we're hoping um, we'll get from DECD here shortly, or at least this spring, and certainly why we're currently um, doing this work. So there's 155 that are deed restricted. There's um, mortgage restrictions, there's rental assistance, and there's government assistance. I, we would need to do additional drill down to get uh, an actual understanding of how what's included in each of these categories and how those numbers were um, arrived at. Um, deed restricted, if you look at the ones that we have for deed restriction, I added these up. I, I will tell you these units that we know are deed restricted that fall to uh, the planning department to um, review that does not total the 155 that are there. So there are some that Nancy has. Um, so there may be there may be others. I know with each of these developments, there's market rate housing as well as the affordable housing. When you're looking at it from an 8-30G um, standpoint, to a certain extent, it all counts for us because it, it count we get credit for the market rate and the affordable portion. I don't know how that's credited for the for this chart that um, and the numbers that come from DECD. So we would need to drill into that further. Um, here you get a, a snapshot of our expirations. So um, this Heritage Glen originally was um, put in place in 95 and it was renewed in 2000, it had a 30 year restriction. It was renewed in 2014 and kicks it out to 2044. Um, we'll be contacting Westwoods, the owner for Westwoods too. Um, presumably they will also be doing a renewal uh, as they are approaching their expiration in 2027, which would leave these 34 units um, on Snowberry Cobble and um, Cornerstone are permanent. Hunter's Ridge, we've got to look at, I think a portion of those are permanent, um, but that's currently under under review. We didn't have that information and it wasn't in the, um, when Bill Warner did the moratorium in 2016, um, it was not uh, identified and in, in outlined in the moratorium document in 2016. So um, does anyone have a, before I, I jump off of this, and this I'll, e I'll email out to everyone. I know it was a lot, it's a lot of math. It's a lot of numbers. Um, so take a look at it and I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions at any point. But I wanted to walk through um, before you looked at it, at least help you with that first part of yeah. what, what train I was on and what direction I was going in. Um, but if there's any questions, I'll, I'll take them. Yeah, Shannon. So Westwoods, so there, so you're going to reach out, re reach back out. So what, what's the incentive for them to continue that? I mean, I, you know, other than obviously wanting to have, you know, affordable housing is a good thing, but like as a property owner. Um, I don't know. I'd have to, uh, honestly, Patrick, look and see. I don't know enough about that housing development and how it was put in place. I don't know if there's a funding opportunities uh, that they become eligible for that lets that renew. I don't know what the incentive is. Okay. Yeah, uh, same with this one. When Heritage Glen was renewed in 2014, I don't know what the incentive is. This is good. Those, are both, those are both rentals. Um, good information for sure. Thank you for pulling it together. And it's just, you're going to obviously enhance it, update it as we go. I was just going to say, like, um, one of the categories was Chaffa. Um, there was a uh, time to own program that is almost out of money, but I think the Chaffa numbers are gonna be higher than what you have. Okay. Yeah, this one. Um, 
Lamont, it was for first time home buyer. And in Farmington, it's a 50,000, five zero grant for first time home buyers. So we've had tons of, uh, I mean, of course, there's no inventory, but you know, I mean, whatever we had, uh, a lot of people took advantage of it. Okay. Well, that's but, uh, good to know. Yeah. But thank you for pulling this together and the numbers. And uh, I'm still stuck. And I know it's late. I'm still stuck at the, that we have a thousand people, but like 30%, like these numbers, like, like mm -hmm. there. That right. I, I cannot get past that. Wow. Right. And it so, would be interesting to see. Again, I don't know um, where that gets updated because that's mm. the consultant that we worked with SLR pulling this together. So they were instrumental in tapping into some of these databases. Um, but I could tap into CROD to see if there's updates um, on those. And that it all it probably all gets updated at the same time with the DECD numbers. Yeah, that come out. So um, once that comes out, then we probably have access to updated numbers um, across the board. So um, when they do come out, we will get educated on our end and try to get yeah. that information over to all of you. Um, Shannon, nope. I have like a really like, stupid question. I was just thinking about Batterson Park, you know, that office complex that had the three arms. Yes. So I know we approved it, but like if it changes hands, can we ever say, hold on, <laughs> do the fee and lieu or whatever, or no? So at this point, and that was part of the issue. So uh, again, no one, none of the developers that came through had any interest in doing any of these as affordable. Ah. And interestingly, on that the the call this morning i listened to i want to say 90 percent of the recording this afternoon because I, I said i wasn't able to be on live this morning with Krog, the Krog sustainable ct and um our our area planners for the area municipalities um the a lot of the planners are hearing that i guess they're hearing a mix of of things um some communities just a flat out refusal to uh, and desire to incorporate affordable housing in any way, shape or form into their regulation. And then the other end, um, hearing from home builders and developers that it is cost prohibitive, which I have heard as I've sat in on other webinars and we get um, for anyone that's had the um, opportunity to listen to the webinar that's posted um, under the light touch development folder uh, from the Home Builders Association. The webinar was in, I want to say early January, um, but from, uh, I'll say, uh, it, it was hosted by them, but not prepared by them. It was prepared by an outside body that's done research and looked at uh, housing from Pretty much coast to coast and and I've even seen on our planners listserv that in the absence of incentives of some type financial incentives whether it's federal state government uh, sorry federal state or local government incentives of some type that hitting a 20 or 30 percent affordable housing rate is not achievable in the absence of some type of incentive mm. so right so that's when I come back to and I and Farmington does not do incentive the, the, there are no tax abatements tax incentives right. in Farmington anywhere um commercial or otherwise so um I don't think that's a I don't think that's a viable avenue and I think we need to be more creative than that um, yeah. whether it's a lower uh, a lower goal um, and seeing how some other communities have structured it um, so that we at least don't lose ground uh, from an include you know if we're going to have a lower goal from an inclusionary standpoint so we're not losing ground um, take a look at the fee and lieu option so that we can get funding to housing authorities so that when there are um, 
homes available, they can purchase or we can at least improve the maintenance of the homes that are already in that inventory. Um, so there's a there's a lot to this. Yeah. And it's its own education. And there's there's a lot of people, right? I there's six there's six nonprofit groups that are doing bills to the legislature. This uh, and that's just the ones that were were discussed. There's perhaps more. There's a lot of people working on this. We are not going to solve this ourselves, and certainly not in a six month time frame. Yeah. Um, but it's just it's chipping away at a few of these things and figuring out what are a couple of things we want to try and get an action list together of what are the next couple of things that we can try. Yeah, I was surprised not to see, is it Lakeshore? For some reason, I thought Lakeshore had some kind of cap on rents, but maybe not. Um, is it Lakeshore on Farmington Avenue? No, it is. There is Lakeshore on Farmington Avenue. There's a couple, but they are not. Um, Either that or it may be uh it may be under the rental. Okay. Uh hang on, which way I'm gonna go here. It may be under a rental assistance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but interestingly too, so and again, so there's the there's the affordable housing number that DECD is reporting, and then it's different than what I have to do when we're looking at it from an 8-30G standpoint. And if we were to look at a moratorium and, and say we didn't want, we're like, okay, we don't want any affordable housing and put a moratorium in place so that an 8-30G application can't come in. Mm -hmm. um, any application, any uh, development, if I, if I recall correctly, that was approved and built prior to 1990 when 8-30G came into being, and I'm paraphrasing here, so I, and I, I might not have this 100% correct. Um, basically, those those housing units cannot count towards any calculation we're doing to a moratorium, uh, an affordable housing moratorium, if that's what we were going to to try to do. Okay. So it doesn't. There's different calculations <laughs> depending upon what you're looking to do, which adds to the complexity of all this and adds the complexity of what we what we're talking about so okay yeah so this is pretty spectacular um then we have the training like you said on thursday mm -hmm. is that okay for tonight or well i just want to make sure does anyone else have any other questions on this and i've got just two other quick things i know we're hitting we're coming up to 10 o'clock so i will wrap up but does anyone else have anything else on this? Just one quick one. The, so and the eight there uh, eight dash thirty. So how many sites in Farmington have we have we dealt with that? that Snowberry Cobble was was came in like that, right? Snowberry Cobble did. Okay. Um, I believe the original application for Yorkshire did. Mm -hmm. So the total Yorkshire um, development, I think, was eight dash thirty G. I'd have to. Sandy and I aren't in the same room tonight. I'm I've got a family member <laughs> with COVID, so I have to be I'm is, I'm isolated. Um, but I have to take a look to see. Um, I think it might have been. But that was just I know Snowberry, I think Yorkshire was 8-30. Um, obviously um, 80 South Road that we just had. And I'd have to look to see yeah. if there are others. I don't know if Cornerstone was an 8-30G or not. Um, but I we can look and, and find out. Okay, yeah, I was just curious. Certainly. Okay. Um, one other thing. We had inclusionary zone map link. So we had we had talked about at the last meeting to do get more info on inclusionary zones. I've I've done other things and I have not uploaded um, additional information to inclusionary zoning, um, the inclusionary zoning tab that uh, we have on our SharePoint site. Um, Garrett found this. 
for us. And it's an ArcGIS website. So this link will go in. And what it does is it tells us where. Oh, I agree. I agree. Go away. Denied. <laughs> so meeting over. <laughs> what? Just kidding. All the, I'm Just working. Ignore me. No, I know. I know. We're <laughs> pushing the envelope. I know. Um, so in Connecticut, what this does is it lists, it's a map, it's an interactive map, and it lists all the communities that have some type of inclusionary zone, some with more teeth than others. Um, I've got Stanford's. I want to read it um, and then get it out to everybody. We have a couple of others. Some of them are some of them are more broad in um, in their language from an interpretation, but also broad as to whether or not it's the entire community or just certain zones of the community. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we can, I'll get you a couple of those so you can start taking a look at what that language looks like um, from some of our other communities in Connecticut. Um, but I thought this map was kind of interesting to see, you know, here's the Connecticut and a handful, there's like 20-ish that have, or 25, there you go, 25 that have some type of inclusionary zoning or at least met the definition for the database that was assembled here. So um, that's all I have for you this evening on this. If anybody has any other questions, uh, Liz has a FYI, Hartford Current had two articles about this subject yesterday, including front page story about tiny house development in Meriden. So we can, I can take a look and try and pull that article as well. Good. Uh, Thank you, Liz. So, but if, uh, does anyone have any other questions or has started to look at something, has a question? Again, if you come up with something and email us, because we'll do just what we did with these other questions that came in and we'll put response together so that everybody has access to the response. Going once, going twice. Everybody's had enough. All right. All right. All right. So minutes, right? Thank you, Shannon, for all the information. Yep, absolutely. We need a motion and a second to approve minutes. Sorry, right? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm new here. <laughs> I'll say it doesn't help that yesterday night was a Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I agree with you on that one, Pat. Oh. Anyways, okay. Uh, Patrick Carey, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the January 23rd, uh, 2023 Town Plan and Zoning Commission meeting, meeting minutes. Scott Halstead, I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and I know Matt. Are we okay, Aye. Shannon? With uh, Mike out, yeah, we still have five. Okay, we have. Yeah, five. we're good. He's he's that's fine. I'm, I'm still here. I voted. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, thank you. 